Thanks for tuning in to Duckworks. I'm Chris, and I just bought this so you don't have to. This is one of the rarest Lego books ever. I paid $250 for just this book. This is The Secret Life of Lego Bricks. And let me give a bit of a backstory as to why this is so important. Well, you see, back around 2019-2020, LEGO hosted a special Kickstarter event where people could actually crowdfund a book. I believe it was around $70 to $80. If you just wanted the book, you could pay more to have it come with an exclusive LEGO element, a specialized official 3D printed working pogo stick for minifigures, which I really want and I'm very sad I don't own, but it's very, very expensive. And I'm not paying $500 for a single pogo stick. I mean, maybe I will in the future, but not today. But I just really did want to have the book because this book, while it does exist in ebook form, nobody seemed willing to share or sell it. But I saw a quote from this book online and I haven't even opened it up yet, but I'm gonna share my thoughts from this book in this video. And it was talking about Lego's policy when it comes to molds. And this is actually the book where we now know that it costs Lego more money to keep molds around rather than just destroying them and maybe bring them back later. So the cost to store and maintain molds is more expensive than just getting rid of them and then maybe bringing it back in the future. I thought that was an interesting tidbit. Somebody who had read the book just kind of posted that as a comment online. I wasn't super interested in the book until I saw that comment because I mean, if that that's a really, that's a pretty radical new piece of information to learn about how the Lego group operates. And I wanted to see what else this book contained in terms of secrets. I guess the book is called The Secret Life of Lego Bricks. Maybe it does have a lot of secrets in it. So I'm actually going to open it up right now on camera. And I'm going to really try to be careful with it because this is still shrink wrapped. So whoever bought this book and I got it from did not actually open it and read it. But what I'm doing is that because the information in this book is so hard to come by, I have not found any real reviews online. I have not found any videos, any websites that go through it. I figured, you know what, why not go through it in a video right now and uh, kind of go through exactly the most important things. So here it is, The Secret Life of Lego Bricks. Uh, wow, this is a big book. What I'm going to do is I will read this in my own time and I'll kind of just go through and take some pictures of stuff that I find interesting so I can share it with all of you. Again, this is my first time even opening this book. So yeah, it's, this looks really interesting. I'm quite excited to read it for sure. It was a very strange thing that Lego was able to actually make a book specifically made for AFOLs. It was marketed towards adult fans of Lego. They charged a pretty high premium for it on Kickstarter as well. And unfortunately, now that it has been finally shipped, it's 2023 now, I believe the Kickstarter process was in 2020, so it took them three years to just make it. They're not selling it anywhere else. You could only get it if you were part of that initial crowdfunding event three years ago. So very, very hard to come by. It's not the rarest Lego book I own. I think the rarest physical Lego book I own is the Inside uh, Art of Bionicle from Bionicle G2, which is a treasure of my collection. And I definitely want to uh, want to have, I mean, I've, I've already put out publications on and a video about that. I'm sorry I'm getting distracted because I'm seeing this book has concept artwork and prototype models of sets. Like there's concept art in here. Whoa, okay. So I, I'm quite excited for, for reading through this. Oh my goodness. Huh. Yeah, well, there, there looks like there's a lot of crazy treasures in here. I cannot wait to share more about what this book contains. I just saw some images of concept stuff that I've never seen before online. So this should be pretty interesting. Let me take some time. I'm going to read through this and then let's jump in right now and take a look at the secrets that the Secret Life of Lego Bricks book has to offer. Okay, so here I am in my library and we are going to be taking a look at the very unique Secret Life of Lego Bricks book. This is 664 pages. So for this video, we are going to be doing kind of a skim through. I'm not going to be looking at every single page in detail. Really just going to try to skim it and call out interesting things that I like to see and things that I find interesting. Now, moments after I recorded the intro for this video, I went on Discord and I kind of asked around the Duckbricks Discord, hey, does anyone like know if you could get a PDF of this book? And lo and behold, a Discord user who has asked to remain anonymous just sent me a PDF. I assume that they were one of maybe the first people to pre-order the book. It was available as an ebook, so they were able to get a PDF. They said it was okay to share publicly, so I have uploaded that PDF to Google Drive. I have linked it in the description below. So if you want to read this book, you can right now just go down in the description. You don't even need to watch this video. You can just go read the PDF down in the description below. So thank you so much to the user who sent this to me. This is 
I legitimately think, I'm not even joking here, I think the information in this book is pretty monumental. It is pretty serious stuff. It's pretty good stuff to know for LEGO fans. It's, of course, a lot of amazing concept art and lots of interesting stuff to see, like concept models and alternate designs and just tidbits and facts. Like, I can let me go on Discord right now because I was just talking through the interesting things that I found. I, I skimmed through the book. This will really be my first time just reading the entire book. But there's facts about Ninjago, how Chima started by being a scrapped idea for animal villains for Ninjago. There was a an idea where uh, Bionicle was the one to actually introduce Technic panels. They were made for Bionicle. There was an early idea for Chima for mythological, like Greek mythology and stuff like that. There was, I mean, let's see. The idea for Ninjago, the gimmick, was supposed to be mini ball joints used for little miniature dragons before they realized that they couldn't get the Mixel joints right by 2011, had to delay them, and that's how the spinners came about, is because they had to come up with something else. Lots of really interesting insight here. There's an insight about how new molds are created, so specifically the tidbit in there it was talking about trains and it's saying uh, unique lego part molds are destroyed after five years of not being in use a strong case must be made to keep them around and it is more economical to destroy molds and to keep them in storage this is what i mentioned in my intro and that's the exact quote from the book so there's a lot of really interesting stuff to see here i am very very excited to go through this i i literally just like flipped through a few pages i flipped to random pages in the book and I found that info. So you can imagine that this is going to be a crazy ride. So here we have the table of contents. What I will also do is I will put timestamps in the description below because I assume this will be a pretty long video going through everything. I'll try to go as fast as possible, but I will do timestamps for folks who want to hear about these particular chapters. Um, so first of all, this is the introduction. I skimmed through this briefly, but essentially, again, the way that this book arose was that via an online vote, fans chose to have the book be titled The Secret Life of Lego Bricks. And that title was given to the author, and it was his job to kind of figure out what book do I write about this. So what even is this book about? This book is kind of an overview of internally in the Lego group. How do they operate? What is the history of the Lego group? How did it come to be? How do certain themes rise and fall? What have what has LEGO learned? What sets sell well? What sets didn't sell well? There's information here that has never been made public ever before until now. So crazy, crazy stuff. And yeah, there's a ton of tantalizing stories and secrets that the author had to be able to publish here. And that's that's how this kind of got started. So this is really interesting. Cool to have a little foreword there. Talks about the initial red 2x4 brick, and they start all the way right at the beginning. So you start off about, I mean, this is just the foreword, right? So this is talking about how they started to get deep dives into the original LEGO stuff. Here, it's like, this is how the original AquaZone backgrounds are made. Like, the original set backgrounds. Look at that. It's just... He got thousands of behind-the-scenes images from promotional photo shoots across every theme in the archives to make this book. Oh my goodness, imagine having access to that. I would, oh, wow, that is insane. But that is, it is pretty crazy. So let's, let's see that. So chapter one, seeing the system, the invention of Lego bricks, and the science of how they work. So this is, again, going right at the beginning, right at the very beginning. Um, so talking about how they were trying to figure out how to make the Lego bricks, there was the design workshop called Lego Futura. So that was something, um, it's been talked about before, but Lego Futura between the 1970s and 80s was Lego design workshop where they would use to kind of come up with crazy novel new ideas and whatnot. So that was what it was. They still have that today. I think it's called like the Idea Lab or something like that. So, wow, look at that. Oh, cool. Working on a Technic model in 1979 in Lego Futura. Wow. Yeah, a lot of crazy stuff here. That's the office. Pretty nondescript, but it is what it is. And that was, again, their new, like, crazy new concept office and, and building that they were being used. So we've got some information here. Again, I'm really trying to skim through this as fast as possible. So you can try to, to just absorb the most interesting bits of information. I think that most of the information in this first few chapter, the first few chapters here are publicly available. Maybe not like all of the images, but I think that all of the information here is basically publicly available. That we, we all know this already. 
It's when we get into later stuff that things get a little bit more interesting. I think especially there's a whole chapter on Big Bang themes and Nexonites and Chima and Ninjago, and even before that, Atlantis and Power Miners. Did you know that Power Miners was supposed to be Miners versus Zombie Dinosaurs? Well, stay tuned, because they have images of that, and that looked crazy. But there's some wild stuff later on. Here is mostly just stuff that I think we knew, but... I'll go over some stuff that I just find interesting. Again, this is my first time reading the book as well, so I'm kind of skimming it as I'm recording this video. They were talking about uh, recycled plastic, and they only used marbled plastic for elements that were ultimately painted, like Lego trees. Hmm, interesting. So they weren't, uh, so things wouldn't be wasted that were marbled. Okay. Search for stability. Right, we know, we know all of this. Uh, people who know about Lego's past know understand how the stability works and how they had to change the tubes for the patent of the Lego brick and whatnot so there's that good old patent there seeing the system yeah I think I think I know all of this if you do not know this you can read it down in the description below the PDF uh, let me see is there anything here that I don't know already okay made out of ABS yep Ideal strength value must remain a secret. It is a defined number measured in Newton. So they do actually have, like, a specific number. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, I think... I, okay, this... I do want to read this. The role of element coach is different from element designer. Element designers work with model designers on a specific model. They concentrate on creating the perfect element needed in that model. Whereas element coaches think about the whole LEGO system and how new elements might be used across different themes. They encourage different teams to work together to avoid too many similar elements being made, and they want to make sure it's appropriate for age groups. Huh. Okay, cool. Uh, in that case... Okay, so they're saying sometimes a new element looks cool but doesn't have a lot of applications, but if they made it widely usable, it's hard for younger children to understand. So that's when they decide to make it super specialized. Makes sense. Okay, interesting. I think I understand all this stuff about how the bricks grip together. This is a lot of like cool engineering information. Yeah, they talk about illegal connections. We we know about all of that already. So this is this is all all information that we know. Yep, that's an illegal connection for the the gold piece there. Okay, trains. Chapter two is rolling along. How the dynamic Lego wheel created a world of movement, got Lego trains on track, and paved the way for sets aimed at adults. Okay, I'm excited. Let's see. Uh, da, da, da. They're talking about town plan. Okay. Uh, any... Okay, so they're trying to come up with the Lego wheel. This is all the way back in the 1950s. So that was something that they really had to do. Some of the ships that could be built out of Lego bricks. Oh, interesting. So this is some early information about how the Lego wheel was developed. There was initially no formal project to develop a wheel. Instead, several employees began experimenting independently. Hmm, okay. And then eventually somebody was, it was someone's job, Christian Lasgard, it was his job to make the wheel. Several prototypes were developed, none were quite right because they wanted to stay true to the Lego system, make it removable and interchangeable. Well, we know that the, eventually what they did, they had the metal axles and the things on the side, so I'm curious what they, okay. So there's an employee observing and rejecting prototypes, cast outside edge of the brick, yeah, there we go, okay, so... First design was held in place by two bricks, but proved unstable. I think that makes sense, yeah. So they eventually made a modified 2x4 brick, as we know, and that was the first Lego wheel. Yeah, okay. So the wheelman, he built his own car garage filled with all manner of sports cars, limousines, dub creation, Lego, Lego and car. Amazing. <laughs> that is very cool. Oh, wow. I don't, I don't know if I've seen this before. That's really cool. This is, this, these are cool stuff. The images are just, wow, that's, that's what's getting me here. Okay. Uh, modernized version, right? His Jeep design became set 330. Yeah, the background's a modern car inspired by another childhood design. That's really cool. Okay, so current rules did not allow a plate to be pressed on the side and its studs, but the designer was given special permission to be as flexible as possible. That is actually technically illegal now for, uh, for plates. Not for tiles, but for plates. Interesting. Okay. There's that nylon hinge. I recently got that in a vintage Lego set. I was curious what that was. Folks in the comments uh, were able to teach me what this piece was. And then now, now there it is. Yeah, that was the one of the Lego group's first soft elements. Okay. Oh, so then they were trying to come up with doing that for the trains. That was inevitable because it was with the trains. That makes sense. Okay, so the new category for trains... 
and they were trying to come up with their original, right, the blue track elements. We know about that, and then the 12 volt rails. Yeah, I just recently got a pack of those. Those are very interesting pieces. I, I found, in Italy, I found a sealed pack of those, like, a few months ago. Uh, I guess over seven, eight months ago now, just in a, a regular toy store, just sitting there, like, just sealed. Yeah, that was, that was a cool find. I did a video on that, actually. But, okay, let's see, what else do we have? Minifigure scale trains. Yeah, so this is talking about the Lego trains in 1980s, which we do know about. They wanted to do all of their ideas. So they have an antique steam engine, a fully realized cargo train. Yeah, so this is when they were really trying to go crazy with the building your own train type design stuff. So that's cool. These are like a lot of interesting stories. I want to take more time after I make this video to really read through this book. I want to read all the stories... One designer tasked with creating the railway station fell Ill, <laughs> fell ill a week before his due date. While the build itself was complete, he had yet to finish the alternate models that were always shown on the back of the set's packaging. In a move that would never happen today, he got permission to take it home, where his wife developed the alternate builds while he lay sick in the bed with pneumonia. That is a cool story. Huh. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that never happened today. But wow, that's, that's so interesting. Okay, two-year hiatus, Lego Train Reborn, 1980. It's making me want to get all these old train sets. Oh, man, this is this book is dangerous for me. Talking about the 9-volt system. Ooh, I do have the Metroliner. Got that also in Italy. That's a great, great build. I love that. Uh, Rise of the Adult Fan. Oh, right, because Lego Afols came up with Lego trains. That was really how it started. So grown-up adult fans started when? When when did the Afol term come out? So my own train was 01 to 02. Okay, interesting. Right, Harry Potter in 2001, Hogwarts Express, everybody wanted that, so now that was when trains really went crazy because then Lego could do my own train stuff because Harry Potter made trains popular. Interesting. Okay, okay. Creating collectibles. So now we're moving on to collectibles and talking about the adult Lego market, which makes sense because that's kind of how things started with trains. Most of the first Lego models targeted at adults began as Lego designer passion projects. Designers speak of this time as if the Lego group were a tech startup. Yeah, I mean, I believe that. Early 2000s, that was a crazy time. Uh, you got the Sopwith Camel, Taj Mahal, Wright Flyer, Eiffel Tower, the minifigure, Statue of Liberty, modular buildings, some of the UCS ships. Oh yeah, for sure. And they had the, the, oh, the legendary Santa Fe Super Chief. I love that set. That was my first Lego train set, actually. I, very, very fond memories from that. Uh, so collectability was their pitch. They, for the My Own Train stuff... Had needed to be a real-world train made with no new element frames. So here's a thing. I don't know if they probably explained this before and we skimmed past it. Element frames are something that the LEGO group calls new molds. So every time there's a new mold, it is referred to in this book and officially in LEGO as an element frame. An element frame basically means, like, for example, if a theme says you have two element frames assigned to this theme, that means that for the brand new theme, they can make two new LEGO pieces specifically for that theme and that would originate from that theme. Um, so anytime you hear the word frames, that's what they mean by molds. So they had to use the existing molds catalog. Uh, they tried to advocate for an allocation of color change frames when they were doing the, the unique trains. The designer's biggest battle was wheel bearings, which had to be in gray, or Santa Fe wouldn't look right. Interesting. So fortunately, LEGO World City was slated to have two trains, so they were able to use the gray wheel bearings on those, so they were, they donated one of their color change frames to the cause. So color change frames are taking an existing Lego mold that exists as an existing piece and changing its color. So putting a new piece in a brand new color would be a color change frame. A brand new element frame is a completely new shape. So for instance, Lego Ninjago might get a new blade element, and that is a new element frame. Whereas if Ninjago got, okay, you can recolor a certain piece. Maybe they want to recolor something, spring yellowish green for the ghost line in 2015. That's a color change frame. So they got to, and teams can donate these one to another. I remember the a recent anecdote was that the Jurassic World team had to donate element frames to the Harry Potter theme because they really needed it for new pieces, which meant that for a certain year we didn't get like any new dinos because it was some of those new frames were donated to Harry Potter. I think that was like 2018. Yeah, there's that amazing Santa Fe set. Oh, I love that set so much. Right, right, because they did another production run. Interesting, right, because it sold out really quickly and that was really big for Lego trains. Okay, power functions. Let's see. 
culminated in power functions, which were interchangeable motors and stuff like that. Makes sense. Power functions doesn't really exist anymore, but they basically have existing elements that work the same way now. Ooh, ooh, okay. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, this is, oh, we're, we're getting into the interesting stuff here. This is the mold store. Whoa. I'm gonna, okay, okay. I want to take a picture of that, actually. That's where they store the molds. So here's where Lego molds are stored. The Lego group has thousands of molds in active use every year with even more on standby. Yep. Every one of them must be regularly calibrated, maintained, polished, and stored in a massive climate-controlled environment. Probably why it's more expensive to keep them than getting rid of them. Prior to the mid-1990s, when computers began making it possible to store information in databases, designers relied on an analog element archive, personal lists, and their own memories to know which parts were available and which were not. That is impressive. Retiring elements and destroying molds occurred rarely, only if a new and better element came along and replaced it. But by the year 2000, there were way too many molds, and that is when they had to come up with their policy of destroying molds. Make sense? Yeah, is this... There's a really interesting quote. Maybe, maybe that, yeah, that's here. Okay, well, we'll talk about that in a second. So they had to simplify the element library. Designers were asked to join a team to use their extensive knowledge of parts and colors to reduce the number of elements. So they're able to cut down on existing pieces. Uh, from 2000 to 2010, they were finally able to assign ID numbers and do the EBT. I think we know about the EBT, the Easy Builder System. I feel like I've heard someone mention that. Uh, they cut over 50% of the variants, only 45 wheels remained, with a fresh new guide for developing tires and rims only when needed. So I think the Speed Champions theme today now manages that sort of thing. In order to keep a healthy balance of available building elements, we regularly have to decide which shapes are exited in order to make room for all the new elements that are created each year. It became harder and harder to justify keeping train elements. Some designers were creative at keeping them active, like using the cow catcher train elements as samurai mech shoulder decorations. Yep, that was a cool thing to keep on using that. Okay, this is the, I think this is probably the most important and notable page in the entire book, I would say. Because I've noticed that LEGO fans have a misconception nowadays at how saving molds work and how the LEGO mold policy works. Every time I mention in videos that the LEGO group destroys molds, people always ask, well, why, why does this happen? Like, why do they do that? Oh, it's dumb. Why would they destroy something? Like... And the, the information, the answer, officially, this is the official answer from an official LEGO book, is right here. Okay, I'm just going to read this out loud because I think this is so important, or I'll read out loud the important parts. So, today, Element Coaches lead a yearly parts catalog review effort. Thanks to the digital database, they can tell exactly how many products a given part has been included with in recent years. Specifically, as you saw back here, they mentioned that it was five years. I don't know. It was one of the quotes said that it was five years. If, there, if an element has not been used in a set after five years, the mold will get destroyed. Going back to quoting it, an element that may not be currently in use could be working its way through the approval process as a key piece of new products. However, designers select an element ambassador to make the case for parts that should be preserved one reason or another. This argument must be robust, and the team polices the element library, keeping it trim and agile. When an element does not make the cut, it is marked as retired and the mold is destroyed. This practice stems from a study that was conducted during the initial reduction of elements, which yielded surprising results. This is, I think, oh, this is the important one. Yep, five years, okay. The LEGO group found that for most molds, the cost of remaking them was less expensive than five years of storage. That finding became part of the calculus during yearly evaluations. If a strong case can't be made for an element in the next five years, retirement is more economical than storing the mold. So yeah, there you have it. That's, that's why molds get destroyed. It's just too expensive for them to keep maintaining them if they don't think they're gonna use them again. I think that there are arguments that could be made for different things. A lot of people are saying, well, they should, shouldn't have destroyed the goat mold, for example. I can't comment on any potential leaks or rumors that maybe the goat mold may or may not be coming back. I can't give a comment on that. If it was, though, that would mean that they had to create the mold from scratch because it has long been destroyed since 2011. And I guess they just weren't able to come up with a good enough argument to keep it around. I guess at that point in time, giving the argument that you can guarantee that a set each year for five years will have the goat. 
I don't know. Like, unless you have an active castle theme, maybe maybe they could just come up with that argument. So that makes sense. Wow, okay. So Power Functions introduced 2006. They did generous product collections of Metallic 9V track. Right, they did the 9 volt track to sell it out for AFOLs. That was when they were transitioning trains. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> Secretly a... Whoa, this is interesting. A hand-picked small selection of the most well-known train builders were contacted and invited to a clandestine week-long workshop at LEGO headquarters in Billund, Denmark. Once there, they were presented with power function elements as well as the few surviving train pieces and challenged them to see what they could do with them. Oh my goodness. Imagine, imagine being like an ape. Like, I'm not even that into trains. Imagine being an AFOL who's like the biggest train person ever. And you're brought to Billund, and they're like, hey, we got rid of all the train parts. Try to make something with these. Oh my goodness, I would... The things I would have done to be a fly on the wall during that meeting. Wow, that is interesting. <laughs> Immediately responded by asking, what have you guys done with all your train parts? You're missing stuff. Over the next several days, they provided valuable but challenging feedback to designers. There were two big emissions, a large wheel whose greater surface area would allow for trains with many wagons... Not a concern for children, but vital for large-scale convention layouts. Makes sense. Uh, secondary train-specific windows, which had given past legendary sets distinctive aesthetics. At that point, however, no new element frames had been granted to the project, so they really had to kind of try to figure out how do we get new element frames. And it's interesting how it's a negotiation in LEGO. I mean, this is like an anecdote. This is a story. But LEGO Education offered up one of their frames so a large train wheel could be made. So they had to go to the LEGO education team and just beg them to give up a frame. I, so that's it. I don't know. I, that's an interesting policy that, like, the designers have to, like, negotiate with each other over getting frames. I guess. I mean, I mean, I guess I work at Microsoft. I work in program management. And we sometimes have to negotiate with teams to get engineers on our team. So <laughs> maybe that's how it works at LEGO, too. I think it's the closest analogy that I can give to that. Uh, let's see. They wanted to do it, the, this is right, the Emerald Knight. Um, a further challenge, to do the train at the size they wanted, another wheel was needed. How do they get another, oh right, so cast both wheels together and bag them right at the machine. Still required two new molds, but it could be stored together, which saved space in the warehouse. So that's why they packaged them all together, right. Okay, another frantic call went down to the warehouse. Whoa, okay, uh... Da, da, da. <laughs> the, the Okay, the LEGO Education single donated frame could support two new elements, but the molds had not been destroyed, so they got to hold it off, and they were able to reactivate necessary parts for the train windows. So that's an example of the LEGO group really listening to fan complaints that they brought in and said, you need to bring back those windows. And so they're like, okay, they weren't destroyed yet, so we can bring them back. Wow, that's crazy. That's so cool. I did not know that that was... All of that story went into the Emerald Knight. Like, that's crazy. I did not know that. This may be the first time this information has been public. That's crazy. Okay. Uh, let me see. Positive reception. Uh, ba -ba -ba -da. Unique. Right. Partnering with Maersk. That was a special color. Color was retired. This time Maersk Blue was back on the menu. Looks like Maersk is back on the menu, boys. Uh, both a special project of hardcore fans a low gift, but there was complication. So they're able to do a Maersk train. <laughs> the team visited Maersk to seek approval for its prototypes, but the odd thing was the record seemed to show the train did not exist. It was painted for a photo shoot. Wow. <laughs> huh. That is so interesting. So some of the earlier Maersk sets had included minifigure helmets in distinctive blue. These had long been discontinued, and due to only ever being included in promotional sets or rare to begin with, they were selling for extremely high prices in the aftermarket, but since the element mold was still active, they eventually gave them the helmets in that blue. That's so cool. That is so cool how they they literally, like, they probably looked at Bricklink and were like, this is way too expensive. Let's just make it again. That's so cool. I like that. That's good on LEGO. Nice. <laughs> okay. Let's see, any other questions? Right, they initially investigated making the Santa Fe in silver, just like the real trick. Whoa. They got a special run of bricks all in silver, but it didn't look nice because they had weird flow lines, so it's poor quality. Right, right. Maybe they could have done it in metallic silver, or drum lacquered silver, but that was before they had that color. So that was 2002, yeah. Wow, 
the, the train section is, I mean, for, I'm not even into trains that much, but this is so interesting. This is so cool. Okay. I think this sounds like, yeah, sounds like that was about with, with trains. Okay. We are, oh my goodness. We are a hundred pages in out of 664. I got to go faster. Okay. Chapter three, populating the Lego world. Uh, minifigures. Okay. I think we all know the story of the minifigure. I'm pretty sure everybody knows how the minifigure was made. If you're curious, you can... What the heck? The set is staged in a brick-built environment with generic dolls. The final sets didn't include the walls, but promotional images. They just used generic dolls in that? That's so interesting. Okay, didn't know that. Um, right, arm elements for buildable figures. So versatile, they were still used two decades later in AquaZone. That's right. What is this image from? Oh, is this like a picture of the... Huh. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, so they're talking about how they were doing the buildable figures. A special machine was purchased to print faces onto people's heads. Interesting. Yes, yeah, so these are the initial buildable, like, homemaker-style figures and whatnot. So you've got those. Let's see. Yeah, I think we know We know the, the minifigure, the creation of the minifigure was very well documented. I didn't know... Huh. I didn't know about this. It's like the biblical story of Lot's wife being turned into a statue of salt. And that's why they were called the salt, the salt pillar. <laughs> really? Okay, that's funny. I, I find that pretty funny. Okay, salt pillar figure. Yeah. I'm going to call those salt pillar figures now. And then people are going to be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> that's really funny. I like that. Okay. There you go. Okay, so this is now, we're talking about collectible minifigures. In 2008, Matthew Ashton, now Vice Principal of Design at LEGO, yeah, he's, he's big in LEGO, returned to LEGO headquarters from a trip around with three inspiration boards. He had been fleshing out an idea, could minifigures be collectible? Wow, so they were starting to talk about this as early as 2008. I guess Series 1 was, what, 2010? So that, I guess that makes sense, like two years to do it. Doing it in blind bags, which was unprecedented. They had done some things in the trio of minifigures for trading card stuff. Right, awareness was lower for NBA figures. They last only one year because it was only big in the US. And initial list of minifigure ideas was created, which has served as the backbone of collectible minifigures ever since. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, some are brought in by other designers passionate about a certain niche interest. Children and fans even write in with ideas. There is no formal testing of ideas for LEGO minifigures, so the popularity is tracked differently than other sets. Right, early waves included various subtle methods of identifying bag contents. These were intended for safety reasons in the event a recall was required. Later waves dispensed with these systems altogether. Yeah, they used to have the dots. I don't know, folks remember the, the old dot system? They had like the, the braille dot system for feeling that and you could kind of look at the barcode and see it was different. Oh, those are the good old days of like series one, two, and three. So much easier. <laughs> Let me see. Other things. Okay, novelty parts. Right, they had to give... Even today, the theme is rarely able to give each figure a unique part because of cost and logistics because every new element requires hundreds of hours work by designers and mold engineers. There isn't enough time, so the balance is made up with color change and graphic design frames, so every character is unique in some way. That makes sense. Oh, interesting. An official formula doesn't exist, but choices fall into three categories. Iconic characters... Figures that will synergize with an IP or other current or upcoming theme. Now that is interesting. I guess because the ninja in Series 1, then you had Ninjago, you had uh, Sun Wukong, the Monkey King, and then Monkey Kid, the theme, came out a year later. I guess they do do that. Yeah. Okay. Right, so they have examples of CMF parts. None of these are special in particular. Too bad there's no concept art for CMFs here. That would be cool to see. But yeah, these are just all... All unique stuff that we've seen before. Okay. They wanted every series to have a minifigure for everyone. Wanted to have roleplay. Sometimes put in silly figures. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Other question. Other interesting things here. Right. So they try to... Oh, interesting. Novel parts are truly the main selling point of LEGO minifigures. So they have been granted a privilege normally reserved for licensed themes or product lines in their first year. The ability to lock elements. Oh. Locking CMF elements is the bane of my existence. They come up with so many great pieces in CMFs and then they just never release them again. It is so annoying. 
I get why they have to do it, but maybe, like, unlock them after, like, two years? Three? I don't know. Yeah. Thankfully, the hazmat guy, which you can see right here, they eventually unlocked that piece. It's now across different themes, so that's good. But I guess that's long discontinued. Unique elements. Monster and power, major, uh, power miners will be locked, at least initially, to preserve a new theme's novelty. Some elements are so unique to their subject matter that they remain locked even after a license theme is discontinued, never to be used again. Yeah, many of the unique headpieces for Dwarves and the Hobbit fall into this category. Unfortunate, but true. Yeah. Okay, so other, other points here, talking about how they were designing the minifigures. Okay, so this is just going back to how the minifigure itself was designed. Talk about the Lego Technic figure, right, which debuted in the Arctic sub-theme. Okay. Oh, experimentation to work out how to make a doll figure. Right, did not stop, right? Because they're kept on trying to make doll figures. Working on the challenges with Lego Belleville. Okay, I think I think we know about all of this. Nothing super crazy that we don't know of already. Right? There were uh, Fabuland stuff. Lego Elves for 2015. Right, and then Lego Friends mini dolls. I think we know all that information. I'm going to skip past a lot of this stuff because they've done a lot of publications, especially with Friends' 10-year anniversary. They put out a lot of documentation on how the Friends mini doll was made. And actually, on my recent trip to Bill and Denmark, they had the Friends 10-year uh, anniversary display there where I actually saw the prototypes in person. So definitely have seen those. Ooh, interesting. Uh, Lego model makers consulted with a fashion designer to develop more exciting clothing to fit with the theme's adventure story. I mean, that's why that's why the, the, the elves had so much drip. I mean, yeah, the, the elves' fashion designs were really cool. Okay, that makes sense now. They, they actually consulted with a fashion designer. Makes sense. Okay. Big plans were afoot for some of the new worlds minifigures could inhabit and designers were about to be briefed. Good transition to the next chapter. Now we are on chapter four, past, present, and future. Okay, so these are the first original LEGO themes. So we're, we're going right back to the beginning. Knights, Pirates, Western, uh, Space, Whatnot, Adventures. All right. Original horse. Yep. Cannon. Okay, so these are talking about the creation of the original, original, classic LEGO themes. So they tried to do it based on three distinct time periods, past, present, and future. So I guess castle, town, and space. So the town plan would morph into an updated version of itself. They were quickly sold in the space theme, focusing on an Apollo-like aesthetic because they wanted to do a big thing with space. Makes sense. One of the modern storage halls and buildings shows how much space LEGO elements take to store. Wow, look at that. Past proves more challenge. Oh, interesting. Okay, so this is when they were trying to come up with Castle, I guess. So wanted to do something in the past. Vikings were under consideration, but then they presented a fully conceptualized medieval theme with catapults, castles, and jousting. So they liked it, but they were concerns. They took their mandate to never make War into Child's Play very seriously. That makes sense. And they wanted to limit the production of new molds, so they were encouraged to use existing elements already cast in gray rather than recasting elements in gray. Makes sense. This was the early, early days of LEGO, so that's, yeah... Swivel hinges were created to facilitate the opening of castles. That's right. Okay, very cool. Yep, they're still used today. How can they do a medieval theme without conflict? Right, so they had jousting and lances and whatnot. They did want swords, so they gave their blades the same name as a Danish utensil for cutting cakes. <laughs> I love that. That's hilarious. Okay, amazing. Right, because they were really against doing like warfare type stuff, so they had to really round off those swords. Oh, wow. Okay. If you're a child and you're playing with a friend, who would want to be the bad guy? <laughs> Nobody wants that. That is so funny. <clears throat> okay, let's see. What else do we have? More information about castle. Talking about the yellow castle. That's right. Armor sticker wields the cake cutting utensil. <laughs> that is so funny. Okay. These are early, early stuff. Talking about Lego Castle's friendly competition, not battles. That is, I guess that's how it started. Early brick-built horses in promo shots, but they wanted to mold horses. Right, right. The early one had a thinner front leg, and then eventually they changed around with the new version for Lord of the Rings. Castle wall panels five studs wide instead of six, because we had the three studs long arch element. Oh, interesting. Okay, so that's why... 
because they would have to use the four stud wide arch too big for an actual castle. Wow, interesting. Cool stuff. Several sculpts of the horse. Oh, I know the story. I know the story. This is so funny. This is the funniest thing. I I, I don't remember. I remember. Where did I read this? I read this somewhere, but yeah, this is a public story. I'll repeat it now because it's cool info. So there were two versions of the horse mold. One was okay and one was slightly wrong because one of the feet were too small. However, the incorrect version was delivered to the engineers, but they messed up and no one noticed it. So they made a massive one and they were like, whatever, but one of the front legs is a little bit thinner than the other ones. So forever, Lego horses had like a wrong size of foot. But then eventually when they made a new horse for Lego Lord of the Rings, it was fixed. So that is, <laughs> that is very funny. Okay, let's see. Six years of consistent sales for the Yellow Castle Knights Joust. Designers left nothing to chance. They're trying to do different types of things. Oh, interesting. So initially they wanted to do Ancient Rome. I haven't, I haven't heard that before. Oh my goodness. There are so many good ideas. Ah, look at... Okay, so let's read through this. This is so cool. Initially they wanted to do Ancient Rome going as far as to build a whole assortment's worth of buildings with classic columns, chariots, and more, but the idea was dropped due to the popularity of an Asterix the Gaul TV show in Europe at the time, so I guess they didn't want to conflict with it. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. That would have been really cool. It's just the Jules Verne-inspired theme that was an entire theme's worth of models, a large Nautilus-like submarine. Oh, why didn't we get this? I mean, they're about to explain why. Children didn't know Jules Verne from a 12th century monarch. The only reaction from the clearly confused room was one boy who declared, the guy who made these things must be bonkers. Rip. Children's test audiences are the bane of my existence. There are so many cool ideas that are just thrown out because they don't go well. I think that would have been so cool to get Jules Byrne and fired Lego sets. Oh, okay. So no like that. Vikings came up, came up again and was developed for a second time, but eventually, I mean, it wasn't didn't happen until 2006, along with several other ideas. Western pirates and a napoleonic wars theme eventually dubbed europa which we have seen pictures of from brick journal so the challenge of the latter ideas was how to avoid conflict so that's why europa got removed so sad we didn't get that very sad about that so that was you know it is what it is <laughs> when placed in the minifigures hands lego bows appeared to be only held not aimed was that like intentional i guess that was like the point for that huh Trusting that children would know what to do, they began to assign specific color schemes for the factions, right? The Black Falcons had darker colors and the Lion Knights had brighter colors. That makes sense. Okay, Pirates on the Horizon. This is introduction of Lego Pirates. They didn't have to be good versus bad. They wanted to make it lighthearted. That makes sense. Romans was still a potential theme at this time, so it would still be an option to use boat hulls across both themes. Ah. Oh. I really wish we got... Imagine if we got a vintage Lego Romans theme. Oh, that would be so cool. Wow, okay. I guess that just didn't happen. Hmm, interesting. Uh, cannons could be used in Western Europa and pirate settings. Oh, I wish Europa happened. Synergy related to weapons actually ended up counting against Western because rivals and six shooters shared too many similarities about with modern weapons eventually led to Western being scrapped, I guess, until later. So... Yeah. Okay, so they began to develop Europa, Western, and Pirates with a winner to be decided later. Thus began one of the most intensive periods of element development in decades. Okay. So obviously we know who won. Uh, Pirates. Sadly, we did not get Europa, which I'm very sad about. But I mean, I, I think if I had to choose one, I would pick Pirates as well. So I guess that makes sense. Ooh, raised base plates. Okay. History of raised base plates. I'm learning so much here, just reading through this. Okay, until this time, base plates had always been flat pieces of plastic, but they wanted to expand beyond or above ground level sheets. Okay, makes sense. They could do Napoleonic forts, mesas for western villages, castles on mountains, and islands rising to the sea. They wanted to do vacuum forming. Right, so we know how these are done, vacuum forming. We know why they can't do it anymore, because it's really hard to do the printing and get those to line up nowadays. So that was how that worked. Yeah, the, right, the Achilles heel would lead to its eventual discontinuation and was present right from the start. 3D base plates were often so large that often little was left in the budget left for the bricks that needed to build a model on top of them. So the design technique, that while it was hidden by colors and genres, were because they just had to do big towers and stuff like that. Okay, yeah, so that makes, 
makes sense as to why they had to get rid of those. Billowing sails, before this they had not done cloth elements, so they were starting from scratch. Sails would become the ship's most dominant feature, whether Roman, Napoleonic, or pirate. It is so sad that we only got one out of those three. <laughs> oh, oh, and that's why they had to kind of push them together to make it look like they were billowing in the wind. That makes sense. They could do it for pirate Roman sails, but Native American teepees and whatnot. Okay. Pirates had been chosen over Western and Europa, but if pirates re uh, reproduced even some of Castle's success, there would not be adequate manufacturing capability. Huh. Right, and they didn't want children to be distracted and move on, so they didn't want things to sell out. So they delayed pirates for several years, even though it was ready, so they could increase capability so they could support both themes. It was the right decision. That is smart. That makes sense. Pirates was just as popular as Castle. Okay. Uh, let me see. So then this is starting to go into flags for factions. So you got the forest men and the right the ghost uh, the the lion knights and the dragon knights and whatnot. Makes oh wow I like that image. I don't think I've seen that image before. Showcasing all the different factions together. You've got like the lightning over here and the ghost. Whoa, this is so cool, huh? I like that image. I don't think I've seen that one. I'm sure like it was published at some point. I just didn't see that one before. That's cool. Okay, so the Robin Hood hat from Lego Castle, trees and secret hideouts added novelty to the Lego Castle theme. Makes sense. Okay, new elements with the Jolly Ghost, <laughs> yes. Okay, official factions for space stuff. Yeah, so that was Space Police. Blacktron were officially the bad guys, that's right. Castle began going dark with Wolfpack, so they were kind of the villainous emblem there. Makes sense. Okay, so they're talking about design of the monkey and the dry. Okay, so the dragon design... A crocodile had been created for Lego Pirates, but was deemed redundant and unnecessary. So, they dropped... Wait. Hold on, hold on. A croc... So, oh, it, so they had... They didn't actually introduce the crocodile until later. I, right, right. The design was complete, so they worked the dragon body around the crocodile's existing tail and top jaw element. What? No way, I did not know this. Look at this. Striving to meet the rule about 10 years worth of uses, they incorporated a feature which, in the end, was not used. Inside the dragon's body, a tube system was implemented that originated underneath the stomach and terminated in the mouth. Possible usages envisioned including a light element for making fire breathing look real, and when paired with a hydraulic pump that LEGO Technic was experimenting with, sprayed water. What? Unfortunately, mold engineers forgot to include the terminal mouth hole, so none of the uses were possible, despite the tube being incorporated in the body's bowels. Wait, they, they just forgot? Like, they uh-oh. I guess they kind of forgot to include the hole. What? Oh. Imagine if the dragons lit up. So they actually, if you take them apart now, they still have those tubes. What? They, they just forgot? No way. There's no way they just forgot. I'm screenshotting that. What on earth? Oh, well now I feel robbed. <laughs> dragons were supposed to shoot water and actually light up for the fire. For the original Lego dragon piece. That is news to me. I did not know that. Maybe that information was public. I didn't know that. This just forgot to include the hole. That's crazy. Okay, wow. Whoopsie. Big whoops. Okay. What else do we have? You have the Islanders for New Prince, blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, Western theme, they had been in development for a decade, so test molds already existed for Palisade bricks. That's right. This was the most detailed printing ever on a minifigure at the time. Flatfoot Thompson was a call out to one of the theme's designers. Nice. Okay, so they made a, a big wall version, kind of a, a log textured version. Uh, okay, oh, so this is this Adventures? Yeah, okay. Concurrently, designers pitched another idea that had been kicking around various forms since the 1980s. Prototype themes based on Tarzan and King Solomon's mines. Early forays had been shut down when the Indiana Jones films began to be released because they thought children might mistakenly believe the sets were based on the movies. So it's interesting how they specifically didn't do popular stuff because they were, they were hoping people didn't get confused. Okay. But by 1990s, it was far enough in the rearview mirror that a Lego theme based on archaeology and tomb raiding would not be considered derivative. I mean, would it not be? Okay, I don't know. Anyways, Lego Adventures, we love it, so that's what it is. Uh, it was presented there. 
It was uh, model makers display prototype sets and themes perused by management and winners were developed further if production capability allowed then released. So Western had the advantage because many of the parts were already somewhat developed. Makes sense. Because they were working on it for a very long time. So there we go. Western beat Adventures 1996 to the first slot. They were inundated with requests for Native Americans to go along the theme. So it was requests for stuff to happen. Okay, so they already had that ready to go. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, no ma magazine box or promo material ever placed them in conflict with either the Cavalry or Frontier uh, Townsfolk. Yep, that is true. 1998 was Lego Adventures. Then they completed the four big historical themes. Castle, Pirates, Western, and Adventures. Now today, we have none of those. <laughs> oh... Please come back, Castle. I kind of just come back, but yeah. Okay, so Adventures took a final bow when just before the launch of a licensed Indiana Jones theme. Yeah, that's how it works. Okay. Tidbits on that. Advent of Harry Potter in 2001. Lego Castle temporarily bowed out because they didn't want conflict with that. Yeah. It's a shame that all the licensed themes kind of took over these original ones. Fantasy era, kind of resurgence, that's right. Theme... What? The theme lives on with individual sets released every few years. No, it doesn't. I mean, I guess if you count the Lion Knight's castle, but that was a one-off. Cat... <sighs> okay, 2008, fantasy era. We got, like, Kingdoms, 2011. And then we got, like, Castle 2015. And that was... I mean, it's been a lot of years since Castle 2015. I don't know if I would say individual sets released every few years. I don't I don't know if I would say that. <laughs> but I don't know when this book was written either. I guess, I, I know it was written in 2020. So, yeah. Uh, oh, whoa. A planned reintroduction during the 2000s was postponed for LEGO Pirates. Okay. And a couple of standalone pirate collections released a few years later. Western was briefly resurrected alongside the Lone Ranger film and for the LEGO movie. And Adventures rose again as Pharaoh's Quest. Okay, so they're explicitly saying these are supposed to be just like what those old themes were just redone. During those amazing decades, they helped drive the growth of the LEGO group. Companies should look to the future, and to do that, they had to follow another group of designers to do that. Okay, chapter 5, an entire chapter on monorails and roller coasters? Oh, this is going to be a fun one. Okay, we are on page 200 out of 600. How, many, how long has this been? It's been a... Ooh, it's getting late. This is... Okay, let me, let me try to go quickly. Okay, Chapter 5. Monorails and Roller Coasters. How the legendary LEGO Space Monorail raised the stakes on innovating new LEGO elements. Let's read this. I'm very excited for this chapter. Okay. Let's do a monorail, someone shouted. The excitement was palpable in 2016. A small gathering of designers was discussing a new initiative that had come down from management that called for the creation of a whole new play experience. In 2016. Oh, the roller coaster. Okay. Makes sense. Lambda called to create a wow moment for children by introducing a new type of movement to the Lego system. One of those options was a new rail system. So a lot of people wanted to do a monorail. Modern monorail. Unknown to... Da, 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 da. Okay. Wow. So this is like when they were trying to bring back the monorail to Lego and they eventually went with roller coasters. But I guess that was spawned from wanting to do monorail stuff. Unknown to all the team members, history was repeating itself because the first monorail track elements were conceived out of an effort to create new and different play experiences. Okay. New Frontiers LEGO Space. So obviously we know the monorail came out with LEGO Space. Just reading through this. I think I know the history of the monorail before. Right, because Epcot and they wanted to... They were inspired by that. Public transport of the future. And let me see. Okay, prototyping the monorail track elements. Yeah, okay. So this was... Oh, this was really cool. Yeah, so this was when they started doing factions for LEGO Space. Came up with the transparent quarter dome. So suggested the advanced civilization. They have big domes. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, I think we... All of this is pretty self-explanatory. A lot of cost. So space alone could not support the cost. So that's why they had to... Right, the rack winder. Oh, originally created to facilitate working elevators. Huh, Interesting. But the designers found many other uses for it over the years. That was a good, good set of pieces. Okay, reading through this, element families. So this is talking a lot about, like, yeah, the bow slopes and curved slopes. That's an element family, and that's, I guess, where the monorail came from. 
And okay, so pitch to develop the monorail for joint use in LEGO Town and LEGO Space, because there are a lot of potential synergies. Onboard motor, no transformers or metal elements, then they could just make them out of plastic. Absolutely. Makes sense. So they wanted to do curved elements needed to fit on a 32 by 32 stud base plate with at least runway aside, so they had to delay the town monorail for that. One where the engine ran atop the track, but the train was suspended underneath. Oh, that's cool. I wish we saw that. Came down to a pair of designs. When nobody could design between them, their respective creators were tasked with combining the best parts of each into the final design that made it into the box. Wow, lots of cool info about getting the monorail together for this. Everything came together when Futron was released with 25 new elements as the first official LEGO Space faction. So, space went away after Star Wars came out. Yeah, it is how it is, but... That was how that worked, with the monorail unofficially relaunched. Okay. We have a brainstorm. A roller coaster would be fun, but they wanted to do something cool for children. Okay, a new track. Three decades later, small group of designers in 2016 debated whether a new monorail could bring a new wow response for children. Reviving LEGO Space's largest set type was not the only rail system floated for consideration that day. There were three proposals brought to management. First, a monorail. Second, a new train track system that would facilitate different types of trains. Huh, okay, interesting. We still haven't seen that. And third, a roller coaster track system. Each of them was put through the target audience children. Okay, well, like kids obviously picked the roller coaster. I think that makes sense. More interested in the roller coaster than, tra than monorail. I think they could have done both. I don't know why they had to pick one, but... I think it makes sense. They use it as girders and whatnot and jousting knights and stuff like that. So, yeah, that was how they, they did the roller coaster platform for that. So, monorails lost out 2016 and uh, didn't weren't made again. Maybe they'll make them again in the future. I mean, I feel like now is the right time, right? They're, they're kind of bringing back old hits nowadays and kind of going back to LEGO's past. I think it's time to bring the monorail system or make a new monorail system. That would be cool. But this is talking about the roller coaster doing... Uh, they're kind of jumping around interest okay so the book is kind of jumping around on developing the monorail the old monorail stuff as well as the new roller coaster so now they're going back to the roller coaster it was worth it to be utilized in a flagship model but has varied applications absolutely yeah it has so many great great usages for those okay chapter six everyday life lego city lego town lego world city there we go let's let's take a look Okay, Lego Town, talking about how that was formed. Okay, talking about how they made minifigure stuff. Right, when the first minifigures came out, the builds didn't accommodate minifigures because they wanted to rush the minifigures out before somebody else beat them. So, yeah. Oh, is this talking about the headlight brick? Yeah, the Erling brick. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, talking about the Erling brick. It fused a one-by-one -one brick with various glass-like protrusions. Then they split it into the headlight brick. Obviously, it's one of the most useful LEGO elements ever. That's a really, really good one. And the one-by-one -one round uh, stud was invented in conjunction with the Erling brick to create headlights. Oh, that's interesting how they were made together. Okay. So this is back to, like, old history stuff with LEGO. So it's going back into the good old days. Oh, this is cool. Well, let, let's read through this. In 1980, 1985. Wow, that's... A variant was approved that can... Oh, right. So that's the five stud side. One by one with studs on all five sides. This was greenlit because the single axis one could build through the brick along top to bottom is consistent with the Lego system. Makes sense. They didn't throw out the finished prototypes for other sizes. Not be the first team to use it. Yeah, okay. So that was all how the studs on the side bricks got made. And designers won because license sets required brick built hulls and stuff to be done. So stuff like this. Oh yeah, that was done for Star Wars. While not released until the early 2000s, the design for the 1x4 brick with studs on the sides was developed in the 1980s. Wow. It's crazy how long things are de in development sometimes until they get greenlit. Okay. Road plates. Ooh, I wonder if they will talk about the new road plates. Although maybe when this book was written that they, they were just... Ah, the new city road plates, were those 2021 or 2020? Maybe they were just coming out so that he probably couldn't talk about them. I don't know. Um... Designers engage in several experiments, or when this book was written, yeah. Okay, so road plates, 
They had to create... So they originally had the town plan mats. That's right. Oh, early roadplay experiment. Oh, whoa, look at those. Connected a variety of models, some of which became official sets. These roadplays were never produced for sale. Whoa, look at those. I've never seen these before. Interesting. How to connect different sets together. Whoa, look at... That's funky. Those are like base plate like like thin base plate pieces huh i mean they're kind of close to what we eventually got the the rounded ones obviously became squares and everything but i mean look whoa that's that's funky that is so weird okay interesting cool prototypes to be shown here okay let's see right they were using it in a grid like this so that was the way they set things up um they were running into similar issues right sand bricks so base plates could not be made any thinner, right? They're trying to make base plates continuously thinner, so... A display for LEGO Space where it shows how road plates were initially intended to make this theme function like LEGO Town. Yeah. Makes sense. This became one of the only sets to include... Or first sets to include an 8x32 stud base plate extension. Right, so that was to go on. There are a couple of issues because they needed to make them perpendicular to the roads and there wasn't enough space. So they had to make an 8x32 stud wide base plate. Despite being popular, each had high production costs due to the sheer number of bricks. They had to come up with something different. Whoa! An employee rounds off the edges from an 8x32 base plate by hand. Using a hand operated machine? They did this by hand? Whoa, okay. Such manual processes made this base plate hard to produce. Expensive to produce. I mean, yeah, I bet. Wow. That's why, we, that's why they're so rare. Okay. Uh, the fire station was notable for its liberal use of windows. And a transparent sheet was made to mimic a pane of glass. Right, that was when they were doing big windows without blowing the budget of dual molding them. Building bigger. Space for such buildings was no longer needed because they were redesigned. That makes sense. After late 1980s, they were usually only included in airport sets for use as runways. Mm -hmm. We know that. Okay. Larger experiment like Lego Nautica would see a working shipping port in brick form. Ah, oh, good, good sets. Yeah. In initially, Lego Nautica was planned as a potential ongoing sub theme. Interesting. Okay. A collection of the most detailed sets created to date. First ever product to include over a thousand pieces in a launch and load seaport. That is such a good set. So it lasted only one year, so maybe it didn't sell that well. Hmm. So they wanted to use all those parts and other stuff for racing boats and Coast Guard stations and whatnot. So intercoastal trade was not exciting for kids, but rescuing surfers from shark attacks was. I like that. Designers wanted to include the real world, so you've got Octan, of course, the gas station. It's a shame that Nautica didn't actually get to be made into its own theme. I would have loved to see that continue on for more stuff, but I guess not super interesting for kids. Do I have that set? Let me look it up. If I don't have that set, I'll buy it right now. Th see, this book is very dangerous for me. This is just making me, like, buy Lego sets. Launch and load Seaport. Because I, 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 yeah, that was a really good, really good set. Let's see. Oh, Daily Mate, of course. Fate has told me not to buy it now. The site will be available in 10 minutes. Well, in 10 minutes and into this video, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get it. <laughs> okay. Right. Octan's still alive. They were <laughs> amazed that it still is. Okay, so challenges with age and video game came to the forefront. Lego Town, they had to split it into two parts. A drop in age range for 5+, plus and so on. Okay, we do know that. So they had to... Change around, because they couldn't do the Erling Bricks for younger kids, too tricky for kids, makes sense. So they had to revisit the past to change things around. Right, they're talking about the divers. Different factions, right, we do know this. They all start to skew downwards in age, that is right. Four plus stuff, five plus stuff. Yeah, not a lot, not a big fan of that sort of thing, but these are good. I like divers, right. One of the last highly detailed, realistic LEGO Town sub-themes, including the Stingrays and Sawfish. That was great. I wonder when they'll talk about Aquazone. I'm excited for that, because they're covering everything here. Wow, okay. Uh, talking about World City, bridge the gap between town and city, using many techniques like the six stud-wide vehicles, that's right. They were designed to make sub uh, subtly futuristic, that is right. That was World City. And then LEGO City, 2005. So we've got LEGO City, which is now around today. Uh, huh. Talking about superheroes. 
Okay, okay, so they're trying to bring in new fans into LEGO, so that's why they have superheroes. Okay. New, new elements in 2005, an updated version of the large panel brick that was molded like the old castle wall panels, which allowed, yeah, efficient use of raw materials. Yep, to make buildings bigger and bigger. This was even more efficient because it has less plastic. That's right. Okay, deviation from traditional subject matter came in 2009. Castle was in the final year and they wanted to have synergy. Right, so medieval market village. They, right, so they had developed a city element, right, for pigs and cows. So they launched at the same time. So city and castle partnered to do this together. That was so cool. Yeah, that was a great time. Lego City was also doing space, jungle, volcanoes, underwater, and Arctic. That's right. We did get that. So that was very interesting to see. Yeah. Okay. Cool stuff. I think, yeah, we've seen this image before. We, we've seen that before for the cows. I believe we have seen everything. Okay. Time for Chapter 7, Technic. Oh my goodness. This is going to be a long video. Because we're... Page 287 out of 664? We are going very slow. I'm going to try to go faster. My apologies. I know people want me to make shorter videos. This is not going to be one of them. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. Wanted to introduce mechanical functions to Lego. You have early axles. Okay, maybe I should break this up. Maybe I should break up this video into multiple sections. Maybe we will end this video. No, but I, I do want to cover the whole thing in a video. I'll go quick. I'll go quick. This is a more informal video, as you can tell. It's mostly kind of just me discussing and reading through this uh, book, which I hope you enjoy. I hope you like this sort of thing. Right, gear and axle elements to make working vehicles like the tractor. Doing model team-like sets for this sort of thing. Wanted to make larger models than ever before. This is the history of how LEGO Technic was made and developed. I think I've, I've seen these stories before. I'm, I'm very familiar with these. If you want to read about these, you can check it out down in the description below. Again, the full PDF. How they came up with gears. Yep, I, I've read this. I've seen all this. Uh, the friction ones versus the non-friction ones. Functionality, yeah, yeah, okay, so I, I think I, I'm very familiar with the history of LEGO Technic because I've gotten really into that, and they had outriggers, so they had to come up with outriggers, oh wow, so they had to make a new lift arm, right, right, okay, there you go, so development of the Technic lift arm there, securing the niche, primarily for children who stayed with the brand longer than their peers, so older kids, yeah, that makes sense, Technic has always been for older folks, Supercar was a phenomenal feat. Oh yeah, that's a good set. During the mid-1990s, Technic reached sort of crescendo. Because they made the Supercar, the Control Center 2. Oh, that is a good set. I love that set. Probably one of my favorite Technic sets. The Control Center one. That was good. Space Shuttle was great. First model to use LEGO Technic beams in the construction. Right, there's the, those are the beams right there. There you go. It's a great build. Because uh, they couldn't use flexible hoses, so they had to use beams. Oh, so the space shuttle necessitated. Wow, a fateful decision was made. All the team wanted was a part for their space shuttle model, but they inadvertently facilitated the next big leap in Technic evolution. They developed a special element with both a straight and angled portion. There was no logical place to incorporate studs because mounting them on any surface would mean they bent away from each other. So they elected to model the new parts geometry in more of a lift arm than a Lego Technic brick, cast with the same height of one module, but it, and the width was a full module to give it more strength. So the first LEGO Technic beam had been born, specifically developed for the space shuttle. So everyone was happy with it, and they finally made it for other stuff. Oh boy, I need to get the barcode reader. That's another one on my list. I'll buy it right now. Oh, so dangerous for me. I do want that barcode multi-set. So once Brick, once uh, once we get Bricklink back up and running, that'll be we'll we'll, we'll be spending some money tonight on this video. Oh. Okay, so. Yep, Super Street Sensation. It was the first Technic bottle to include beams, flexible hoses, and new decorative plates in the same set. So you've got those panel pieces. One of the theme's most realistically shaped vehicles to that date. Other points of discussion including Mindstorms, Bionicle, and Studs. Mindstorms, yeah. We'll be getting to Bionicle, don't worry. Bionicle, that's a, that's a whole chapter to itself. So, there were several possible directions for LEGO Technic to take. Should it continue to evolve the types of models for which it had been known for the last two decades, or should it move into robots, or perhaps into Bionicle-style action figures made into entirely new pieces? The other matter under discussion was the question of studs, 
So they were tr Oh, whoa, really? I didn't know this. The flagship set, 8466 Off-Roader, was prototyped using two different construction methods. One was a mix of Technic bricks for the internal structure, with beams, hoses, and plates adorning the exterior with a variety of functions. The other version used only Technic beams, both for the details and interior structures. So they were not ready for release because there weren't quite enough connections, but everyone could see they were only a couple of components away from an entirely independent LEGO Technic system without a stud in sight. So the question was, was a model without iconic studs a LEGO model? Well, I think we know the answer to that one, and, uh, Bionicle would like a word. Yeah, okay. That was how they were trying to get into that. Major evolution. Oh, I do want to read this quote. Studs have always been our brand. When you build a model with studs and plates, you have the most stable construction. But there was an in-between time when they had two systems of play. They had Technic and Bricks, but eventually they had to decide. So they had to develop new beams... But there were some concerns, so deliberately they sometimes use some of the old bricks just to make studs be visible, because they're a huge part of the brand. Clearly it's not a problem anymore, but I guess back then, yeah. And you know what, I've, a lot of my friends to this day, I've, my good friends, a lot of them don't know that Technic is made by Lego. If they see a Technic thing and they don't pay attention to the Lego logo, they often think it's a different toy company's brand. So maybe that, that is a true thing. Like, I, I have a lot of friends who are like, oh, what, what toy brand is that? And I'm like, oh, that's Lego. And they're like, oh, I don't see any Lego studs. So it definitely is something that is um, that is different. So yeah. In the lead-up to 2007, a pair of streams converged. The first came to Bionicle. Initially, they had covered functions, mechanisms, and internals with more exotic armor and plating. Designers wanted to test a theory. They discovered a large system plate element, originally invented as a base for couches for LEGO Belleville. Designers used those plates, along with recently developed Technic plates, to create the flagship tow truck which was, uh, do they have a photo? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, is that, yeah, yeah, tow truck. So they were using those big panels to have a full realistic exterior with Technic plates and system variants. That was, that was the design that they were doing, so that was very cool. And Bionicle really pushed them towards stuff. Okay, what is this? By 2000s, late 2000s, construction had grown into a full-on system, but then 2008, they wanted to do battle vehicles. So they were tools for roleplay in the same way as a pirate ship or police car. They could swish them around a the room. So there was no expectation the interiors would be exposed for viewing. It would have been odd to have it anything other than enclosed. So this is very cool. Bionicle, it was because of Bionicle that the Lego Technic shells were made. With the uh, Rocco T3 and Axelara T9, they had the big shells being made. The cur they just made the one curved shell, but eventually they started to use it for Lego Technic. So Bionicle is actually the reason, like, look at that. That's what Lego Technic shells were specially created for Bionicle, just for these models, specifically to make them closed up. Isn't that really interesting? That is so cool. I, I had no idea that Bionicle was responsible for modern Technic shaping today. Thanks, Bionicle. <laughs> okay, what else do we have? Okay, a new era of licensed models. Yeah, this is a big, big one. So, when Technic was starting to get into licensed stuff, they wanted to kind of get the wish fulfillment of owning a, a supercar or some, like, really fancy vehicle, but not having to pay for the real thing, so you get the LEGO version. So Ultimate Concept was a new line of Technic products that were larger and more realistic than ever before. The centerpiece would be super supercars. Porsche was the one that partnered with them to time it with the GT3 RS. So, great opportunity, very tight development schedule, so it was a very, very tight lineup because they wanted to have all the cars follow the same scale because it would set the size, detail, and precedent for everything that followed. So that was a big, big deal. So, previously suspension had been a major visual function, but exaggerated movements would, out, would look out of place for supercars, so they had to do highly skilled design work to allow it to move up and down a little bit, but not feel ridiculous. They had to make a new wheel. That is right, unique rim element... Wow, that is so interesting. So, they had to create a new rim element. They had seen it at a top-secret Porsche test facility. Initially, they were to be cast in silver, but after 3D printing some prototypes, it was a little bit too small proportionally compared to the tire. It didn't look right. So, they had to mold it in black because they just couldn't do it in silver. Interesting. Okay, because they had to do it in black to, ma to match a tire so you wouldn't see the transition from one to another, it was an effective solution, but it didn't stop them from noting the issue and vowing to correct it on the next car. So they just ran out of time. That's why the wheels are in black. That is so interesting. Huh. 
Did not know that. That's really cool. I mean, I'm, I'm learning so many new things here. Oh, bucket wheel excavator. That's a good one. Okay, okay. Very cool. Oh. Whoa, look at that. Wow, they were coming up with all sorts of different systems for this. That's so interesting. So supercars, they were trying to do big flagship stuff, so... The team lead repeatedly sent team members back to the work tables to make it even bigger. I respect that. So, multiple prototypes, they each had a fatal flaw until they came up with a big foundational element for a large turntable. That's right. Yeah, the curved gear rack. That is a good, useful set of pieces. So the new strategy for Technic came out in 2016. Eventually, they came out with new tires for the Bugatti in 2018. So they were expanded a little bit to do it in silver. So that was very cool. Yeah. Okay, cool stuff. Okay, here we go. We're getting into the meat and potatoes. We are page 343 out of 664. Chapter 8, New Worlds. Lego Bionicle and the Lego Star Wars transform the Lego group and set the stage for future successes. This is going to be good. This is going to be interesting. Okay. All right. Starting off with Lego Star Wars. Designers had no doubt in their minds which set should be the flagship for the launch of Star Wars in 1999. The Millennium Falcon, which was designed and ready to go. Huh, but that didn't come out till 2000. So maybe they, they delayed it. Right, because they wanted to have all the Episode 1 sets first. Okay, so... Elsewhere on the building camp and, campus, another team... Oh yeah, okay, so, so there's some information that we're about to see here that I skimmed through. I jumped to this when I first got the, the book. I jumped to this section because I wanted to read it. And... It was really interesting seeing that in this book. I I learned a lot of things that I had never known before. So let's get into it. They are trying to come up with a new family of parts. Ball joints and torsos, larger than 1970s Lego building figures. They're really big, hardly recognizable as Lego elements. They represented seismic foundation shattering shifts. Two of the Lego group's most legendary themes. Two... Two of the Lego group most legendary themes. That's a typo. Lego groups. What are you doing? And an iconic collection of parts that would define childhood for a whole generation of children. Okay. So they're trying to come up with a cool factor for kids. Yeah, there's, there's our guy Faber. A creative partner named Christian Faber. Since the 1980s, Faber had worked in a team that assisted the Lego group with product development and launches. That was Advance, I think. So they would even used uh, Star Wars and stuff like that. 1995, they developed and pitched a new idea for a narrative-led theme. In this concept, humans had created artificially intelligent robots called Cybots and sent them deep below the Earth's surface to collect energy crystals. Once there, a contingent rebelled, and a storyline then centered around... Centred? Cent Why are there so many typos in this, this chapter? Okay. Centered around a conflict between the rebels and those still loyal to humanity. We have seen Cybots in Faber's detailings from um Faber files before so that was really cool to see that and uh never was made but underground exploration was kind of a trend several themes were fully developed including one that nearly edged out explorians really huh interesting uh this underground space theme was deemed too similar to aqua raiders which was a sub theme of aqua zone so they had prototypes for drill bits and mining elements abounded at lego future right so they were trying to come up with all sorts of mining stuff and eventually they made Lego Rock Raiders. So that was how it happened. Cybots did not make it to market, but several of its story beats were incorporated a decade later into Exo Force and Power Miners. Oh yeah, that's right. Huh. Yeah, the humans uh, versus uh, robots. Yeah. Those later product lines, however, were not the most enduring and important legacy. Of course, it is Bionicle. Realistic, almost organic movement. Taking limbs as inspiration, they used modeling clay to craft a ball at the end of an arm, which slot into a receiving socket. Still clearly a Lego toy, but also very unusual. The pitch went nowhere, but designers stored away the ball joint into one of the many Lego Futura drawers. Imagine just going in that office, looking at those drawers. I would, oh, I would kill to be able to see that. Nothing at the Lego group ever truly dies. Talk to any Lego designer, and you will hear stories about them developing, developing a model, believing it to be a wholly original concept, only to be told upon showing it to a colleague that their idea had been fully developed years before, possibly multiple times. So... The ball joint story followed that script. In 1999, Faber was brought in to assist with the Slicer and Throwbots, so they had to come up with those. And that was the ball joint posability for unlike any other LEGO product. So that was what that was. So they were short-lived. LEGO designers referred to these as in-and-out themes designed to last a year or two to spark an exciting fad and fill in around higher-profile Big Bang themes. They, however, wanted to do it for a more ambitious concept. And in 1999, when they were getting ready for LEGO Star Wars, 
What if the LEGO group owned a big property that could support a blockbuster movie? What if this had spawned certain action figures? And that was Project Genesis. Yeah. I have never heard of this before. Never. I, I consider myself to be a LEGO historian. I would like to think that I know a lot about LEGO's history and a lot about old things from the LEGO company's development and history. I have never heard LEGO Genesis ever before. If you Google LEGO Genesis, nothing comes up. Like, there's, there's no results about this. Like, LEGO Genesis, like, LEGO Genesis, um, early cancelled LEGO line? I don't think there's, like, any documentation about this. Like, these are all videos on top 10, like, cancelled LEGO stuff. Like, no, there's an LEGO Genesis. This is the first time it's been mentioned. Like, I, I think this is the, this book may be the first time we have ever heard about LEGO Genesis ever. So here's the story of Project Genesis. This is so interesting. Okay. Oh, look at that. Look, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, I'm, I was freaking out when I saw this. Okay. Genesis was named because children were going to be able to play the part of creator in a new universe was an entirely separate line of toys consisting of no elements compatible with the LEGO system. Instead, they constructed creatures with large, molded, interchangeable heads, arms, wings, torsos, and tails. These appendages, which were sculpted to look like they came from animals, humans, robots, and fantasy creatures, were joined to one of the several torso variants. Torsos had multiple ports for joining them together, or connecting the various appendages, and creatures could be large or small, bizarre or recognizable. Construction was facilitated by a brand new prototype friction hinge, which would lock into a socket, then both rotate and articulate. Far from Bionicle, Genesis was separate from Technic, not marketed under Technic. It was made up of detailed organic components made to look like real or slightly fantastical body parts. No studs, no pins, no nothing. Just unique pieces. And obviously, Galador. I mean, I think that when you see this image, you may think, oh, that's just like prototypes for Galador. But Galador, I think, until this point, until literally, like, me reading this right now, I think we had all thought that Galador was just a one-off thing that they wanted to make. Obviously, they put a lot of money and effort into it, and they wanted it to be successful. But I don't think we had any idea just how big they wanted LEGO Genesis to be. So, this is so interesting. This is so cool. On top of that foundation of articulating pieces was envisioned another layer infused with technology. First was a voice unit embedded in a neck wrap component that was held in place between a creature's head and torso, allowing it to speak. Even more daring was the sonic receiver, integrated within another LEGO element for which there were huge plans. This piece was endowed with technology that could hear sounds tuned out by human brains, the intent being to embed signals in all manner of media that would trigger responses in the constructed creatures. It's so cool! It's so cool! The LEGO group planned to build a huge multimedia empire around Genesis, with video games, TV shows, commercials, live events, and more. Each of these would be laced with audio signals discernible by Genesis' sonic capabilities, allowing children and their creations to interact directly with what they're watching. Sets would have instructions for creatures that would appear in this media, and if built, would respond to what happened to their character on screen. It was the Toys to Life idea more than a decade before Skylanders, and far more ambitious. But unfortunately, I think we all know what happened to this amazing concept and this very, very interesting idea for a LEGO thing. And that happened, and what happened was Galador. So Galador was an in-house theme that was intended to become a hit TV show and game, keeping with the grand vision for this new release. It was debuted a year after Bionicle was released when it seemed like systems like this were the future. The challenge was that Galador didn't easily fit into a single toy aisle, which confused toy retailers. Was it a building toy, an action figure, an electronic product, or a TV tie-in? Consumers didn't recognize it as a LEGO offering, nor is there any precedent for a live-action TV show based on LEGO projects. Designers had to unlearn many hard and fast rules to come up with their products, since none of the toys used existing elements, Every single component required a new mold, making it incredibly expensive to produce. However, going back in time, it was still a few years away, late 1990s concept was still being worked out, realizing that the parts suggested robots, the team proposed an outer space setting for the new line, dubbed for the time as simply Construction, 
So the line was supposed to be called Construction. Like, Construction was supposed to be the name of the theme. Nowadays, we just refer to it as any buildable action figure, but that was the original name for an outer space Lego buildable figure line. But then they announced they were doing the first ever major licensing deal producing toys for none other than Star Wars. So, very quickly, because they announced they were doing Star Wars, they realized that making another theme on intergalactic conflict with robots was not only redundant, but off the table. So they couldn't do it again, and so while a new team was working on Star Wars, the construction team went back to the drawing board. So now we shift focus on this to the Star Wars stuff. So they, wanted, they didn't want to do realistic weapons, but one weapon is, was a necessity, and it was futuristic enough to allow to be made, which was the lightsaber. So there's the... This might have been done by Faber, actually. The early sketch of a Star Wars logo right there. Lightsabers and spaceships. So initially, the lightsaber hilt element followed standard LEGO design logic. A stud at one end and an open tube at the other end, which would receive the transparent bar that represented the glowing blade. In Lucasfilm's initial... <laughs> this is hilarious. In Lucasfilm's initial review, LEGO designers were told, you should probably make it so that a blade can be inserted on both ends. Confused, since the request was unprecedented based on films released to date, Lego Fos asked why. No reason in particular, but you definitely should do it, was the response. So obviously, first previews, you see Darth Maul with the double-bladed lightsaber. It's a good thing they told them to do it for both sides of the Lego piece, because now that you can connect them end-to-end, -end, it made them so much more useful. So there's that classic lightsaber piece. They had to make other elements wanted to make the Millennium Falcon a flagship element, so they scaled down the ship, shrinking all the proportions, and borrowed the rounded panel elements from UFO for LEGO Space, and made a new ring, uh, wing plate for the ship's front elements, which obviously got used for a lot of stuff. And eventually, they pitched it to Lucasfilm, but the model was not taken forward because they wanted all these sets to accurately be scaled to minifigures. So Starfighters and Pod Racers were the upper limit in terms of size. So initially they wanted everything to be minifigure scale. That's pretty wild. That's crazy. They, they told them not to release it because they wanted it all to be minifig scale, but designers were like, nah, that doesn't matter, which I think was smart. So yeah, there you go. The first 1999 Star Wars sets only had vehicles that matched the scale of minifigures. So they, they were not allowed to release the Millennium Falcon. That's crazy. Moving on then, going back, switching focus again to ball joints. It's kind of jumping around here. They were trying to go to the op opposite setting. Wow, wait, so Star Wars is the reason as to why Bionicle is the way it is? They wanted to put them, instead of a high-tech futuristic world, and more archaic and primeval world. Huh. That's kind of funny. Thanks, Star Wars. <laughs> wow, okay. So they were inspired by Cyber Strikers with the Technic stuff, like Rock'em Sock'em robots and stuff like that. That makes sense. This is very funny. So... They thought Boneheads of Voodoo Island, which was the original concept for Bionicle, would be an instant hit. Unfortunately, they realized that kids do not like it when heads of characters pop off. They did not like that. So, what they did was they stopped Boneheads of Voodoo Island, and then there was a big question mark on what would happen to ball joints, because that didn't go well with kids. Meanwhile, LEGO Star Wars was super, super successful. Obviously, they had to make a few specific pieces... But there was one very special piece that they had to introduce. Right, talking about Seatron, they had considered making special heads for aliens, but they did not make it. They made a skeleton and whatnot. They relaxed some of the rules to make different types of figures, but Jar Jar Binks is the reason as to why we have molded heads today. Because every other element created for LEGO Star Wars could be used throughout the LEGO system. Qui-Gon Jinn's hair, you can use that for other figures. Ninjago uses it as a Chronix's hair. Starfighter canopies, you can use it in other sets. Spaceship engines, even a new type of hinge for more friction. Everything that was made for Star Wars basically could have been used outside of that. However, when they made the Jar Jar Binks head, that was, that was an important one. I think the images of this PDF are like a little bit out of order. Because that was talking about something earlier. But yeah, Jar Jar Binks head right there. And... And that's what they had to do. And then they were making the perfect cockpit, so they are trying to figure out how to make the perfect cockpit for LEGO stuff, for unique things. Sculpt a classic Rogue Squadron helmet for the X-Wing pilot. Wait. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on, hold on. I may have... Did I just... I, did I skim through this too fast? Did they say they were trying to make Technic Star Wars vehicles? Huh? Uh, model team... Oh, so this is probably the start of the Ultimate Collector Series sets. 
So Technic went for internal accuracy, Model Team went for external detail, line was discontinued, the designers moved on to Star Wars, they pitched a new concept that was Model Team in space. No new element frames were available. Oh, so they assumed that the, the Technic figures would be actually be put into the UCS sets. Oh, they even sculpt that's why they sculpted a helmet for them. That's so interesting. But then the Lego Technic figure was cancelled, uh, discontinued, so they just didn't have figures. Aha. Uh -huh. Multiple iterations of both ships have been developed, including one with, the, with a pneumatic system to operate the opening wings. Huh, that's so interesting. Right, the Aquazone dish now works bluntly flipped on the side, but no existing component looked right for the X-Wing. So they had to make... They had permission to make a new cockpit element, but they were short on budget. <laughs> Somebody in the team knew somewhere out in the factory there was a mold casing standing around for an old 4.5 volt battery box. The cockpit was just made in that casing with new inserts. That is crazy. They just were able to reuse that mold. Whoa, that's so, this is a cool story. Look at this. That's why it didn't have room in it to make a hinge on the element, which is why it only has a 1x4 plate on the back, and they had to build a hinge in the model separately. When they redid the X-Wing many years later, they made a new version of the element with two click hinges. That is crazy. They just they didn't have enough budget to make the X-Wing canopy. So they just had to take an existing mold that was sitting around, fill it up with just enough space to make that canopy and release it. A lot of wild stuff that goes on in this company. Holy moly, okay. <laughs> so interesting. Oh boy. Wow, okay. Back to Bionicle. That's cool. I don't think this image has ever been released. Concept Bionicle image for the Mask of Life. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. So... Christian Faber was inspired by his nephew uh, playing superheroes, so masks was a big thing. And he wanted to showcase that mask episode power, and that was a breakthrough. So they only had to minorly tweak the boneheads concept. So instead of losing heads, they could acquire and wear masks. So losing it made them vulnerable, so that was cool. They could also make them collectible because children... <laughs> Children could gain more cred by having more of the rarer ones than their peers. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> yep, that's, uh, that's how it so works today. Um, so they had the Toa, and so on, Bionicle, Biological Chronicle, a testament to the universe's size and sweep. Some voice concerns as to whether the Lego DNA could be seen in the bizarre, gangly Bionicle figures. But instead they were confident that the Lego system was clearly present, but manifested in a different way, but released in 2000 and 2001. So... The enemies were made mostly from Technic and construction with civilian characters as well. Story was told in the first for the Lego group, which were regular comics. Yeah, it was the first time we actually got those, each professionally drawn, and that was when people were introduced to the island of Matanui. So oftentimes, designs were sketched out by hand. Very cool. Making frames. Okay, so this is just talking about the history of Bionicle. Uh, da, 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 da. Distinguish them. Different armors were grafted on the interior skeletons. Mass, yeah. Short-lived reboot in 2015. Pain. <laughs> Hundreds of different variants were developed and whole storylines revolved around key masks. Yep. We know that. We all know that. After the setback of Galdor and the cancellation of Genesis, Bionicle was unique. Oh, this is so interesting. I think this is one of the most interesting tidbits about this. After the setback of Galador and the cancellation of Genesis... Bionicle was unique in the assortment and so successful that at one point the team suggested taking it and construction as a whole in an almost unimaginable direction. With several years of new element frames being allotted to Bionicle, the assortment of construction pieces compatible with the ball joint had grown. The Bionicle team observed that LEGO Group now sold two completely unique building systems, one based on studs and the other on ball joints. They were so different they could be their own brands. They proposed pulling the construction system entirely out of the Lego group and turning it into an independent brand. I cannot fathom Lego ever saying yes to that. That is wild, though. This would allow them to target an older age demographic and tell stories with edgier tones. They envisioned worlds that were darker and grittier, inspired by steampunk, fantasy, and the tabletop game Warhammer 40k. Oh, that would have been so cool. Oh, that would have been so amazing. Construction would have been expanded so that it, like standard LEGO system bricks, would have multiple themes under its banner, set in different universes from Bionicle, all built with ball joint elements. 
decorative elements compatible with construction would be developed to make monsters, demons, griffins, mecha, and more. In the end, however, the company decided to keep everything under a single banner. Imagine in an alternate universe where this proposal was successful, and Bionicle became its own freaking company, and there was an entire company that was developing construction stuff and making action figures separate from Lego. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine Bionicle splitting off from the Lego group? That would have been insane. That is so... I think that's the first we've ever heard of that. Okay, moving on. We are still on page 372. This is going to be a long chapter for sure. But I think this is the most interesting one for me. One of the most interesting ones. So, Lego Star Wars. Let me read through this really quickly. Oh, right. The curved shape elements. Thanks, Star Wars, for making these. Mm. Let's see. Evergreen sets. Oh, that's an interesting way of seeing it. So, how to turn a highly detailed model for a specific vehicle into an evergreen set. So evergreen sets long existed with evergreen themes. I think it's the first I've heard that term being used, evergreen sets. Police stations had always been part of the Lego portfolio, even before minifigures ushered in town, but police stations could vary. Star Wars was different. So I guess evergreen sets are like sets they have to keep producing every few years. Like I would guess the Ninjago Destiny's Bounty, maybe the, the Monkey Kid Monkey Mech is another one. Obviously there's like X-Wing, TIE Fighter, and so on. Millennium Falcon. So... Several vehicles, including TIE Fighters, Millennium Falcon, and Jedi Starfighters, were identified early on as ships that needed to always have some variant available on shelves. Clearly not Jedi Starfighters anymore. Sad. <laughs> Additionally, they began allocating a certain number of element frames each year to refreshing portions of the ships. So new cockpits, wings, engines, or bubble canopies provided visual distinctions from what came before, improving them every time. Play features were also used... For distinguishing them, so originally you do them by hand, and then you do it with the knob turning, and then you have rubber bands, and then you have a much better way of doing it nowadays with a lever, so that's how they change things there. And then shape elements, the curved ones, were embraced by the Lego group because of Star Wars, so they're, they're the reason why those exist. Uh, building for size. So they had to incorporate Lego Technic bricks as structure, we do know that. They rescued many elements, oh, interesting. Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. What is, what is this? Huh? Whoa, wait, hold on, hold on. What? Uh, this is new information. Brand, I mean, ugh, all this is new information, but... Uh, whoa, whoa, okay. The L-shaped 5 by 5 Technic Brick was developed in the late 1990s for what would have been the largest LEGO model ever released and whose identity was so secret that designers are still not permitted to reveal it. Slated for release in 2001, this cancelled set was so massive that it justified the development of the L-shaped brick all on its own. Set 8466 was the only set to include the element for the first four years of its mold's existence, showing it had big plans. Just before it was deleted from the element library, it was resurrected for LEGO Star Wars. Well, hold on. I don't care about that. Th this, is, this is much more interesting. What? Largest Lego model ever. Identity so secret they still are not allowed to say what it was? What could it have been? Why can't they say what it was? It's been, it's been 20, it's been 22 years. They still can't say what it was? So massive, it had to include, it, they made this brick for it. There's no way it was the... I mean, why would it... Cancelled? Supposed to be released in 2001? It wasn't the... I don't think... I mean, that was just two rectangles. No. Comment down below. What do you think this model would have been? Supposed to be the largest Lego set ever. They made a new brick for it, released in 2001, and they cancelled it. Let me know in the comments. What do you think this was? I am... I am so curious what that was. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Talking about designing specialized minifigures and uh, the blasters, the guns, of course. They were trying to not do realistic weapons, but they eventually had to do it by 2007 because they wanted it to 
be used for stuff like that. So realistic grips for blasters and whatnot. There we go. And of course, yeah, there's the uh, the Bionicle elements there. Oh, that's just sketched on. Huh, interesting. They hand sketched that. Okay, talking about Bionicle, they were changing the look of the characters. Hundreds of masks with various powers came and went as the universe grew. After several years, Bionicle become, had become an evergreen Lego theme where its own history mattered. Lego City could be completely reborn every five years or so to greet a new generation with no ties to previous storylines, but similarly rebooting Bionicle would disrupt this the universe and alienate children who love the story. Keeping it going, however, meant new fans had the challenge of having to catch up on years worth of lore and world building, without the benefit of easily accessible movies and TV shows. Right. That was the nail in the coffin for Bionicle. Didn't get a TV show or movie that was, like, always coming out. So, initially, Construction were to be treating it as it had a movie, and they definitely, like, succeeded there. Slowed down around the mid-2000s as people grew out of it. There was a high bar, so younger sibling generation did not embrace Bionicle as enthusiastic leading to a story themes can the story themes cancellation oh, halfway through a planned 20 year run 20 year run for bionicle i think i knew that it's cool seeing it co officially confirmed though i think faber has hinted that before i didn't know they had like a 20 year plan for bionicle that is crazy okay cool construction lived on not anymore though <laughs> sad <laughs> yeah Star Wars continues to be an evergreen theme. That is true. The legacy continues when they're creating their own unique things. Okay. Chapter 9. We're, we're getting through it. Page 381, Playing with Story. How licensing and a focus on storytelling led to an explosion of Lego themes and laid the groundwork for even bigger things to come. Robot arms, stuff like that. Hinges. Yeah, okay. Bionicle is a blockbuster. We got to go through these pretty quickly. This is already a very long recording. But, okay, so it's needed reimagining. They were breathing new life. Right, Lego Knight's Kingdom. Story and action figures. They made large buildable knights, but they didn't want to alienate children who love building structures, so they did a dual strategy. They did the core, the core things for builds, but then they also had the story and they had the action figures. That was a really cool type of thing that they were trying to do. New molds, repurposing new elements... They were using never-before-seen hues and distinctive elements. The few new element frames that Knight's Kingdom did have, few new, they had a lot of new element frames. Knight's Kingdom had a ton of new element frames, but they were devoted to its riskier venture, which were brick-built action figures. Construction elements did not mesh seamlessly with Lego system pieces. They were going to be knights, not robots, so a variety of new pieces were sculpted to specifically match the minifigures. The challenge was how to impart dynamic movement. They devised new composite parts, using it to rotate and articulate simultaneously and several types of receiving elements. So that was, yeah, that was the new click hinge system. That makes sense. And yeah, there it is. That's what they're talking about. Rotate and articulate. There is Vladek. The Lego group didn't know it yet, but an organic sea change was underway. Lessons learned were meshing with others acquired from adjacent themes. Over that course... They launched Lego Harry Potter. Okay, so that was that what took over Lego Castle, kind of. So they were trying to do licensing, but they really wanted to focus on physical spaces for Harry Potter. So they primarily took it place took place in the Hogwarts Castle. It was almost a character itself. Let me see. Development of prototype models had to be bigger than ever before. This is probably going to be talking about the modularity, right? Dollhouse theme builds, yeah, could do similar things with large interior spaces. Uh, topped with the Belleville roof line. Yep, that makes sense. Right, rearrange the castle sections and the ingenious new rotating staircase element, which could be magically set into a number of orientations. That was a very cool piece to have. I think it's still around today. So they made the whole modular system for the Hogwarts castle and they used that Belleville tower right there, repurposed. Makes sense. Oh, that's so interesting. So they had to prototype the sets without access to the movies. The Hagrid's Hut was prototyped as a simple, easy-to-build square structure with mostly traditional Lego castle pieces. But the design had to change when the film series was announced and reference material showed Hollywood had imagined it as a more challenging round stone building. Huh. Interesting. They couldn't take any photographs, so they had to rely on memory and images on the internet. Wow. That's crazy. Okay, they were tight on security there. They're trying to make new element frames for the molds. 
Uh, so yes, yeah, so they were trying to see if they had developed a formula which could be applied to other valuable partnerships. And that's true. Hollywood's a very connected town, so once the word had got out that LEGO had made two of the world's biggest franchises into successful construction toy lines, other potential partners came came knocking. So then, first was the ones they had ties with already, so Lucasfilm for Indiana Jones and Warner Brothers for Batman. And then Nickelodeon came for Avatar The Last Airbender and Spongebob. And of course, you had The Hobbit stuff, Speed Racer, and The Simpsons, all sorts of licenses. And now we have so many licenses today, so all sorts of crazy stuff. And specific things made for those licenses. I wish they talked a little bit more about Lego's relationship with Nickelodeon. That, that's an interesting topic, but you can't cover everything in one book. Secrets of Construction. Okay. Okay. Making Mecca. Knight's Kingdom was discontinued after three years, but a small cadre of designers had watched its development with keen interest. United by a mutual love of Japanese manga, they saw an opportunity in the buildable figure hinges. So they wanted to do Mecha because that was now possible. They had appeared in Life on Mars, but it wasn't really... They would have been limited in size and mobility, but they wanted to do their whole on world and storyline for Exoforce. Yeah, that was a classic, classic theme. So they wanted to introduce, uh, maintain interest through a new suit or face print for different storylines, and they wanted to go all in with the manga inspiration. Yeah, yeah, Exoforce. So they wanted to do the points for the spiky hair pieces, but the sharp points could present a hazard, which is why they had to use a softer plastic, but unfortunately it did not perform as expected. It looked great, but lacked proper clutch power, so it was insufficient for achieving the proper friction, so they're very prone to losing their hair. So eventually they would have to kind of continue to redefine and continue to make that better when they were doing more stuff, but... Yeah, now nowadays, if the element is a headpiece, it has been just to fit much tighter if it's rubberized. So that is how they work. Yeah, talking about the robots and how those worked in general. So the figures can do movement and whatnot, so they could be staged in cool action poses. Battle droids were not menacing, which was something else that needed to be different for Exoforce. Can we finally get a battle droid redesign, please? Ah, uh, but yeah, so... They were doing bulkier elements, so that was a cool thing to make them fully posable, which is very nice to be able to move them around. You have the Exoforce robot hands that can rotate. Uh, dual color molding was still not possible, and tacking on transparent one by one round bricks looked ridiculous rather than menacing, so instead they used the Technic Cross Hole. There you go. Talking about the storyline, they wanted to do Vivid World Building by Bionicle. It came out concurrently with other original LEGO themes. Vikings and Dino Attack, or Dino 2010, and they were doing a collective shift in different worlds they were trying to explore. They were, yeah, oh wow, this is talking about the development of Dino 2010, exceedingly expensive to produce, so lesson learned they would never appear again, and lack of versatility. Is this a new, is this the first time we've heard this official name for the system? Lack of versatility was a major motivator in the eventual creation of an animal building system platform. I think that is the first time we've heard an official name for that. ABSP? I've never heard that officially be used ever. Which undergirds, yeah, modern Jurassic Park dinosaurs and other creatures. Yeah, I didn't know that was the official name. That's cool, I like that. So Vikings, they've been trying to do it over and over, but then finally they were able to get it done, so that was how that worked. Just one problem, parts. Oh, I do know the story behind this. They wanted to do the horned helmets, and the parts catalog in 2006, they had to come up with basically using Bionicle pieces to make large-scale Vikings dragons, figures and weapons. They wanted to do something a little bit different for Harry Potter and Lego Castle, so that's why they did Vikings. It was difficult to tell good guys from the bad guys for opposing minifigure armies. Understandable. So they wanted to put creatures in the mix. They wanted to have sets with goodies and baddies in them, so you solve that problem by having a bad guy creature in every box. It was common practice, and it was a major success. That makes sense. Yeah, that's what they do nowadays. Conflict in a box. This is really interesting. I think I heard this story before, but they tried to initially have... They had two new element frames towards Vikings. A double-bladed axe and an iconic helmet with horns, but they both looked wrong cast in the same color because gray horns out of a gray helmet wasn't right and they didn't have the expertise in doing dual-molded helmets or anything like that. So their solution was instead to do two pieces. Do the horn as a separate piece and then do the helmet as a separate piece that worked out and 
Eventually, they needed three pieces, but they only had two element frames, but they actually, appeals are always allowed, so they petitioned management for an additional frame or additional mold, saying the new horn would be incredibly versatile, which I definitely think was the right choice, because that horn piece is still being used so much today. And the need for novelties, they're trying to create more unique things every single time for bold stories and original story novelty driven themes da, 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 da. okay designers reimagine stalwarts like castle space aqua zone and pirates building on them are we gonna get into the okay yeah so we're talking about fantasy era mars mission so going into that era of stuff aqua raiders pitting man versus giant instead of not two competing humans so that was a uh, man versus giant underwater sea creatures so because of parts developed right before that they could make big brick built animals very cool and yeah the homegrown themes were working they brought the necessary time a system was emerging or a funnel so short-lived novelty themes did work yeah they definitely did however during the 2000s they wanted to do new product lines new product lines developed designers worked in the watchful eye of a creative lead on one of five primary teams present day future historical basic and lego technic do we have that still today for original LEGO themes? His what, are, what is our original historical LEGO theme today? I wish we still operated under that today. Yeah. Twice a year they would come to... Uh, for every... What? For every Black Shrine, Lion Knights, Aquanauts, or Fort LEGO Rado, there were at least two or three other options with a full range of products from small to large that were rejected. We know Jules Verne Romans. Constructible musical instruments called Band Booster. I think that's the first time we've ever talked about like I've never heard of that before. I think it's the first time that's been mentioned. That's so cool. Space miners? What? Oh, I mean I guess we kind of have we got that in collectible minifigures and we got that, I mean, kind of with Mtron. Mtron's more of a cargo thing, but that's interesting. Yeah. Wow. So cool. Okay. Each theme, they sob cut and glued to develop pieces, but eventually they had to create a new process for a funnel of creative ideas. This is really, inf this is cool information as to how they're developing original themes. Throughout the years, they have potential licenses. Designers can propose passion projects. So of course, Lego Ideas. They have CPL, the Creative Play, uh, Creative Play Lab. Incarnations were front end or concept lab. The concept lab was the name I know it under. I think Creative Play Lab, I didn't know about that name, or I'm sure that's out. Advanced Concept Group looks at long-range trends, develops specific ideas. So many interesting things here. Uh, an early brainstorm at front end for LEGO Power Miners. New building base for small creatures. Oh, interesting. New mole, and we'd kind of see that for Chima later on. Explode creatures, earth, so they would go different levels. So rats, worms, and insects, and trolls, gremlins, rock monsters, water, crystal, lava, and the core. There you go. Trying to figure out how to do the crystal for maybe ammo or build with it. Drill element, eye element, and hair on monsters. Wow, lots of interesting stuff here. Oh, that's cool. A designer in concept lab draws a concept for a future model. Huh. What is that? It's like a, it's got like spider legs, a head, almost looks like Fenrak from Bionicle. And you have like a, a base underneath it with tridents. Was this a, an Atlantis? Oh, this is the portal of Atlantis. Right? Yeah. This is the portal of Atlantis, or what it was meant to be. So I guess the spider-like legs are supposed to be like a mech of some sort? I mean, may, uh, I could be wrong. I thought this thing around here looks like the eventual gate that we got for Atlantis. Like the where you place the crystals in. Huh, that's interesting. I don't know what that is. Ideas can be un uh, undefined and vague. They can do underground explorers with rock monsters or interstellar cops and whatnot. So how do they funnel down the ideas? Okay, this is this is so interesting. Early concept art for Lego Alien Conquest, which the original idea was aliens versus farmers. So the aliens were kidnapping their farm animals, and the farmers were fighting back in their farm-inspired vehicles. That is so goofy and funny and crazy. I really like this, honestly. This is a really funny one. Kind of wish we got that, to be honest. I do I mean, I think what we got was okay. The militaristic design for it was, I guess, one that made sense for that kind of trope of movies, but... This is just goofy and wacky. I like this idea for farmers versus aliens. Oh, 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 oh. this, now this is interesting. One concept tested with children, 
The LEGO Power Miners fight undead dinosaurs rather than rock monsters. Children wanted rock monsters over undead dinosaurs? Really? Oh, man. Look at this. Look at that. Oh. Look at this world. This is such an exciting world. So the skeletons of dinosaurs are, like, reanimated with crystals. That's pretty metal. That's really cool, actually. Whoa. Oh, I could, I could just stare at all the details here. That is such a cool concept. Wow. I like that. I like that a lot. I mean, the, the driller vehicles are basically the same. You can, I mean, this is, this is just the thunder driller right there. Right down to the intakes on the side. Undead dinosaurs, though. Ah, we were robbed. I wish we got that. I like the rock monsters, but man, that's cool. Okay. Yep, so that was the... We've seen this picture before from Brick Journal. So I've already done an actual video on early concepts for Space Police. So you can check that out on the channel. Uh, prototype of a lava monster. I don't think we've seen this particular one. We've seen other ones, but not this particular one. That's cool. Uh, successful ideas. Da, 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 da. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, yeah, there's a Squidman's hideout. I guess originally it was Pliskin. <laughs> that was his name. Huh. Wrecking Ball Weapon, I think it had that. Ground Vehicle, Police Ship Drops Troopers, Oil, bar oil Barrels Blow Up. Yeah, this was the Squidman's Pit Stop set. That's a good one. So, when themes have been determined, options within them are still open. Key models and elements may have prototypes and there will be lots of sketches, but plenty of work remains to be done. For each new set that makes it to shelves, five and ten other possibilities are considered and rejected. Team members work together to develop new elements. That makes sense. Reviewed by model committee, element coach, and building instruction teams. At this point, nothing can be changed. Power miners and space fleet three hit shelves. Phase three of the transformation was complete. They now had a functioning system for developing new ideas. But then we get to Big Bangs. Okay, chapter 10, Big Bangs. Let's take a look. Mini ball joints, collectible treasure keys, there we go. Okay. So in 2009, they were thinking of ideas for a new collectible play experience aimed primarily at boys ages 7 to 9. After Bionicle, they wanted to come up with something unique, and the theme was about to be retired, so they had to come up with something new. So the desire to create something was growing, Exoforce was a big hit, so that was a big one, but they wanted to do something even bigger, looking for an icon. An icon is something widely recognized and appealing to children across different cultures and countries, categories of characters or settings that immediately evoke certain universal images. Ninja is one of those icons, so they wanted to be careful to avoid icons that are not actively being used in current movies or TV shows. So obviously, they- whoa, 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 what? They, they made helmets, legionnaire shields, and column elements? What? I did not know that. I, I mean, obviously we talked about this earlier in the video, but they initially had the ancient Rome theme, but it was too close to Adventures of Asterix, so... That's how, that's how that works. Wow. Because they thought it would be too close to the thing and be disappointed when none of the minifigures matched the on-screen characters. As a host of icons are quickly sent into LEGO, three icons enter the pipeline that no major entertainment properties were currently exploring them. Deep Sea, Robot Dinosaurs, and Insect Invasion. I guess we got two out of those three. I wish we got Robot Dinosaurs as a LEGO theme. That would be really cool. A wildcard concept was Future Ninja. Hmm, okay. Somewhat surprisingly, Future Ninja tested better than Robot Dinosaurs, so it joined Deep Sea and Insect Invasion on the other side when they started to create unique things. So Deep Sea was eventually Atlantis, Insect Invasion, I guess that's Galaxy Squad? Really? Robot Dinosaurs lost to all of those? That's disappointing. I'm surprised by that. Okay, well, if, if, it, if it won, we wouldn't have Ninjago. So, you know, that is how it is. These are sketches for Alien Conquest. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Doing the robot arms, the tentacle one. Okay. <laughs> Using potentially Atlantis armor. Uh, not surprisingly, Alien figures were focused for insect invasion. Oh, oh, that's Alien Conquest. Oh, so initially they were like insectoid type stuff. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, this would eventually be abandoned in favor of entirely specialized head elements for more generic aliens, the insect concept having been shelved for later. Right, that was Galaxy Squad. Under the Sea had explored with Aqua Raiders, but the challenge was to create play scenarios with fighting animals. So, 
Initially, they were trying to find, like, generic treasure, but they wanted to have something more unique and add more drama. So that's why they wanted to have LEGO Atlantis, which could only be accessed through a portal, which could be opened via special keys. Searching for them would be the mission's backbone and the focus of most sets. Once collected, each key would be put into a corresponding slot in the Lost City's doorway to open the portal. So you need to get multiple keys, they're all distinct and unique, and that makes sense. They suggested coming up with large molded elements to snap together into sea creatures. Huh? Oh, what? We almost got, like, special molded sea creatures for Atlantis? No, I really want that. Oh my goodness, we were so close. Okay, so, designers develop multiple concepts for large molded elements, snapping together for enormous serpents and turtles in the style of uh, Dino 2010 from 2005. Oh, like, old big stuff like that. Several of these pieces were designed and prototyped before being abandoned. The number of frames available meant it would not have been possible to eat to give each set a unique creature. You could have done like one of them for a big set and then just do brick build for the rest, but okay, whatever. Instead, special minifig compatible elements were sculpted which enabled the creation of hybrid human sea creatures. Octopus legs, shark heads, and of course, they take the box for novel figures, which was a universal goal. Oh, look at that concept art. A concept sketch and subsequent detailed drawing for a human octopus hybrid which would become the squid warrior. The brand new tentacles would fit underneath a standard minifig torso and open new potential for that. Such techniques would be used for the snakes in Ninjago. Yeah, I mean, I guess they were supposed to be a lot more unique and movable than they were for the eventual thing, which, which basically just took the octopus piece and made it into a minifigure format. But, I mean, that headpiece is basically the same as what we got. Like, this is, this is the squid head that we got eventually, so that's cool. It was one of the other new proposals, Future Ninja, that proved the most challenging. While it had passed initial testing, support was not entirely universal. In popular imagination, Ninja were sneaky assassins who worked alone and almost had no variation in their looks or mission. How could interesting, long-lasting play experiences be made out of them? However, exploring ideas that may initially seem doomed is the whole point of wildcard concepts. So eventually, they start to come up with an idea on how to make Ninja work, using Batman as a precedent. So first here we have some early sketches for Lego Atlantis. Oh wow, look at that. These are just all sorts of unique things on how to make the different elements for Atlantis. Oh, that's kind of like the pyramid thing that we saw in the in the TV show. Huh. Treasure in shark mouth or a portal in the shark's mouth. Yeah. Rotates around. Oh, the portal that we eventually got was so cool. Oh my goodness. These are the molded animals. These were the specialized big animals for Atlantis. Oh, that would have been really cool. But eventually we did get the Shadow Snapper thing and a head element for a sea serpent. Wow, okay. Initial ideas for a portal with various key elements to be placed in Lego Atlantis. Yeah. Wow, okay. Cool stuff. Moving on though, back to Ninjago. The Dark Knight provided inspiration for the team developing ninja concepts they used an array of cool gadgets and vehicles. Okay, so they wanted to make the team feel like more of a group of secret agents. Oh, wow! The note read, Alpha Team done in Japanese style. That is so interesting. Lego Alpha Team, yeah. Okay. Instead of general skills, the ninja would be masters of various weapons, which of course they were. Initially, they included four ninja students, each with a weapon specialization, setting off on a mission to rescue their kidnapped old master from the ominously named Dark One and his troop of ninja clones? Huh. Okay. Uh, new parts, shuriken, spears, swords, nunchucks. Additionally, in a throwback to bionicle masks, unique hair and visor elements complemented each armament. All the various parts were brought together into a new concept board that was once again presented to children. An early idea was to give each ninja their own visor or helmet that would correspond to specific skills or powers, but the concept didn't really work for minifigure sized things compared to Bionicle. I mean, I guess eventually we got the Oni masks, but that was years later down the line. It was not intuitive for children to distinguish between the good guys or bad guys when the face wear was this small. So they had to regroup and develop the people even more, and each side needed to be distinctive. Everything was on the table, including non-human options for both good and bad. Children were responding well to images of special armaments and armor, which suggested that missions revolving around trying to acquire sacred weapons might work well. Because of this, it was clear that future ninjas still needed work, so they proceeded with LEGO Atlantis first, which would buy more time for developing ninja. And that decision would prove more important than anyone could possibly realize. I'm, I'm guessing that's because Atlantis had the 22-minute TV special, right? So then they were like, let's do Ninjago as a full TV show. Oh, whoa. 
Well, look at this. <laughs> One of the earliest element concept sketches from Frontend's Ninja Team gave an indication of the range of new LEGO pieces they had in mind, including visors, weapons, and unique hair pieces. This feels like Exoforce to me. This feels a lot like Exoforce. This is so cool, though. Wow, look, I'm going to screenshot this. I'm going to save this in my Ninjago concept art directory. Whoa, that is cool. I like these designs. I, they're very different, but I do quite like them. Shuriken Shooter. That'd be cool to get as a LEGO piece. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. That kind of looks like the Galaxy Squad fin, doesn't it? Huh, interesting. Okay, and here we are. The concept board shows the ninja's first concept with evil ninja clones and the heroes wearing similar white outfits. There you go. There they are, facing off against the Dark One, which I guess he would become Garmadon, but one of the... I think this image already exists. I'm pretty sure we already have this image out there, but it's cool to see it, the actual digital version. Okay. They realized it didn't have to be just generic ninja, it could be an IP. This was the first time where they felt they could create a cast of characters that could have more than just names, but also backstories and developed character traits. The theme could resonate and potentially compete with all other stories that are occupying the headspace of children. It could be more than the sum of its parts. <laughs> One of the ideas for non-human ninja heroes, dragon ninjas. Wow, okay, so we could have, we almost got this for Ninjago, where the heroes are dragons. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay. We'll revisit Ninjago in a second, but next was for the Alien Clingers, blah, blah, okay, setting was the next major consideration. Atlantis tested and scored well because it was an icon, it wasn't really utilized that much. Insects were shelved for the Alien Invasion theme, but they would serve as villains years later in Galaxy Squad. Space transitioned the action from Earth to conflict, right, for the StarCraft type stuff. For this round, called Alien Conquest, it was more straightforward for saucers invading LEGO City, allowing for easy crossover play. Okay. The alien pet could fit over a head, and defending it was the alien defense unit. Yes, yeah, so we've seen a lot of concept art for that, but then now they weren't quite sure where to put the future ninja. Future ninja was the initial idea, but initial responses had been muted. They expected to see ninja, not secret agents, with ninja-style weapons. So they realized the key part of the ninja icon was the hooded robes. So whatever headpieces they made would need to be traditional and immediately recognizable. Thankfully, that freed up a new element frame because they previously delved into Ninja during the late 1990s, specifically 1999, and these these molds were still in existence? Really? I guess this was before they were destroying molds. So they just got really lucky. They just, like, someone maybe messed up and didn't destroy the molds from Ninja. So they still had that. But if they wanted traditional heroes, would that also mean they prefer a historical setting with almost generic heroes? In fact, they want the exact opposite of LEGO Alpha Team in Japan. So resolving that became vital because it would heavily inform everything else. So they returned to the drafting board with past, present, and future for Ninja. Past was from fantasy era castle and even a bit of LEGO Vikings. Undead warriors rode ships and skeletal horses under the watchful eye of a reanimated dragon built at least partially of construction elements. We did get a skeleton dragon many years later for season 13 of Ninjago. They had traditional matching outfits rode forth to meet this nightmare army from a Japanese style castle with catapults. Ninja were mounted on horses or a flying bird whose headpiece. What? What? No way. They had that since 2011 or to even earlier? No, that is so cool. So that headpiece for Fantastic Beasts originated from ninjago oh that's news to me that's so interesting okay wow that's so cool that is so cool i think that really drives home the point that a lot of this book is saying early ideas just cop up, crop up again years later uh for the present they utilized the backdrop of modern day asian style city where the vehicles just slightly futuristic were placed it was alien conquest in japan with cyborg shoguns as the invaders they rode motorcycles and cars built from shape elements they battled mechanized animals consisting of hybrids of scorpions and snakes using the ball joints. Finally, the futuristic setting was an advanced cityscape with layers of roads and buildings. It was the purest incarnation of Alpha Team in a Japanese setting. Teams of ninja faced off high above the metropolis amid buildings crackling with electricity. They had energy-based weapons, but the present-day setting was the clear winner. Huh. I, I mean, I guess, yeah, Ninjago is kind of like a present-day-ish setting. Time frame was now defined, then they started to create characters in the overall mission. So, no trace would eventually present in what would eventually become the characters. 
They faced off in three different missions against a trio of possible options for bad guys. One option depicted cyborg shoguns in a Japanese metropolis fighting over sacred weapons ensconced in a dragon temple. In another option, it was placed adjacent to an evil-looking cityscape belching out pollution, populated by biker gangs with a penchant for purple. Now that sounds familiar. Finally, the dragon temple with weapons was across the lake from an evil fort like he mans castle Grayskull. In this scenario, birdmen with unique heads flew dragons against the ninja heroes. Whoa. These are all crazy con concepts. Okay, so there is the... Cityscape for the future one was later used as inspiration for Ninjago City in the theatrical movie. That is right, and used to reboot it as well. So that is... We've seen this image a lot, but that is a cool one. Look at, look at Sensei Wu. <laughs> look at him right there. Oh, wow. This is interesting. Yeah. Oh, whoa, whoa! I don't think I've seen this before. Holy moly! Oh, this is exciting! This is a prototype model. An early sketch model depicting the action shown in the Metropolis would eventually become Nindroids in the rebooted Ninjago 2014, and the Dragon Temple would be refined into the Fire Temple. Wow, look at that. Look at that motorcycle piece. It's like one whole piece right there. Huh. God, that's a, that's a goofy looking, goofy all looking car right there. Um, the Ninja themselves, those are interesting hoods. Huh. That kind of reminds me of the Dawn of Iron Doom, or like a robot Great Devourer. This is so interesting. Wow, look at look at that. And obviously the fire temple, right, that splits apart. Huh. With a dragon. Ah, oh, that's so cool. I love seeing prototype sets. And what's fascinating about these boards is that aspects of each would eventually be produced in some form. The cyborg shoguns would become the ninjroids, biker gangs would be the sons of Garmadon, and the mountain scenes bird creatures would become chi what? Lego Chima? would in fact grow out of discarded ideas for animal-based bad guys from Ninjago? Wait, Chima came from Ninjago? Oh, that's crazy. Okay. So here we have some prototypes of ninja weapons. Oh, those are those are cool. What, what are those? Huh. I don't know what those are. That's so interesting. Like, are those supposed to be like dragon head fire blast things they can mount in their hands? These are cool. I like these. They, they don't really feel like Lego to me. But I do like the look of them. Interesting. So even after so many tests, front end wasn't even halfway finished. Eventually, there would be present for tests with over 800 children. A selection of concept board backgrounds would be reused at various different options. Some, if there was like a motorcycle, sword, or villain consistently noticed, and that's a sign the team was onto something, then they would develop that. First, the villains shouldn't be other ninja. Eventually, undead skeletons won over traditional samurai and a villain reminiscent of the Terminator. Second, good guys should ride dragons, but bad guys should not. Vehicles should be big, cool, and primarily used by villains, although some use by ninja was okay too. They wanted personalities and connect with the characters. That makes sense. Oh, this is new. The developers eventually settled on the idea of unique ninja distinguished by color, preferred weapons, skill set, and most importantly, their own small dragon. Well, that didn't happen. That last aspect was key, since it was going to be how the ninja theme met the brief's demand for collectability. Entry through the product line would be through inexpensive dragon sets, each with a ninja minifigure included. Best of all, they had an idea for the new elements to create these creatures. Wait, did they try to do Mixel joints all the way back in 20, 2011? That's crazy. Okay, so in tests we have different types of skeleton bad guys, including a Terminator-style cyborg version. Oh, I kind of wish we got that. That's kind of cool. I like the samurai ones, though. Those are interesting. An early idea for how the ninja might look like under their robes, with interest suggesting personalities. Kind of looks like Kai's Ninjago movie outfit there. Oh wow, these like actually do kind of map to all the ninja. You have Kai, I guess Jay, Zane. One of these is Cole. Yeah, interesting stuff. Oh wow. So grids on sticky notes to map out unique features of the ninja. Each character's unique dragon has been sketched out at the bottom. Aka is red, Edward blue, Connor black, Wally green, Rafia white. Huh. So fire, water, earth, wind, and lightning. Those are the original ones. Oh, that's funny. Creates tornadoes. Hmm. Creates lightning, moves the vault, creates earthquakes and lava. Controls water with sound. Oh, because they were trying to make them like different themed around different interests. This one likes music. Controls light and fire. Tech savvy, musician, mechanic, explorer, athlete. Wow, that's so interesting. Okay, so Fire Dragon, Water and Ice Dragon, Earth Dragon, Wind Dragon, and Lightning Dragon. 
It's funny all these like eventually all got used in Ninjago for different things. Okay, that's cool. Setting out to create collectible ninja dragons. They wanted to avoid using construction style ball and socket joints that didn't look compatible enough, but they wanted to make mini ball joints so they wouldn't stand out in a model and be easier to conceal. Prototypes were made for the first wave of Ninjago, but turned out to be far trickier to get right than expected. Yeah. Oh wow, so there was no way they could perfect this in time. Eventually they were not abandoned, and they used it for Chima and Mixels and whatnot, so the mini ball joints. Oh wow. Essentially the exact purpose for which they were essentially envisioned. They were... The Mixel joints were made for Ninjago? There's an alternate timeline out there where they, we call them Dragon Joints instead of Mixel Joints. That's crazy. So they got rid of small-scale dragons. That's news. Okay, that's that's interesting. Could the ninja be turning when they fought spinning super fast like a tornado? Could they make an element to make minifigures spar? Right, so this was Spinjitsu. Initially, they did brick-built elements, but none proved acceptable. Then molded versions. Designers resisted using weights for a long time to keep costs down, but eventually acquiesced to integrating brass because it dramatically improved performance. Oh, that's interesting. Over 100 different prototypes were made for spinners, and finally, they made a successful version that was finally developed that uses a spring-loaded injector function. Then there was a major setback. Product safety said the spinners wouldn't work because the risk of a minifigure with a weapon in its hand flying into someone's eye was too high. Oh my goodness, so they went back to the drawing board. Wow, so they, they had to basically just get rid of all that. They had to make a 3D printed prototype of a part that holds a minifig's feet but goes up and down as the spinner rotates, right? Names on the patent for the eject function. Oh, that's so cool. Okay, well, let's look at these. These are brick-built versions for Ninjago spinners. Huh. Interesting. So they were trying to do different platforms to knock them off. Yeah, these, these are not... You gotta have a molded piece. Yeah, these none of these are cutting it. I can see why. They were really trying to come up with ways to make it happen. Wow. Huh. Interesting stuff. Okay, so then, okay, prototypes were tested for different methods of holding minifigures in a spinner. Look at all of those. Wow. <laughs> it's a regular Lego turntable in there. And there's the final one. Huh. Okay. It's so cool seeing these all laid out. Okay, so it was too hard because they didn't want it to shot fly too well, bounce into someone's eye, so essentially... They got inspiration from a nearby waterway and solved the problem. Sinners blew the roof off, and they said that you have a mega hit on your hands. Yup. Spinners were big. So as LEGO Atlantis was in the final stage of development, someone suggested a new idea. What if it had a short movie? It had very distinctive elements for compelling visuals. The LEGO group would have to finance the entire venture itself, took a gamble, made a 22-minute special, which increased awareness of the theme and drove upfront sales, and Ninjago suggests an, even daring, suggests an even more daring idea. What about an entire TV show? Big Bang themes, that's right. So change from an aspiration to a proper name for a new class of Lego theme. They need an X Factor, so a TV show or media, and it's something really cool and different that attracts people. So Ninjago Spinners, Nexo Knight had the powers, Chima had Speed Ors. Yeah, wow, okay. Reception was high enough to just find an entire TV show. Several people had pushed for an investment in writing a full season of episodes before the special even aired, so they were able to get it quickly enough that Ninjago was still on the public's radar. Wow, so they, they took a gamble and got lucky. Okay. There you go, the, the cards. Spinners were modified into actual tornadoes, coining Spinjitsu. Spinners were the top-selling toy in Germany for 2011? That's crazy. Wow. So they still wanted Ninjago to be replaced by a new theme, eventually came up with Chima, and to protect it, they, no new Ninjago bad guys would be animals other than snakes for year two. Yeah. In many ways, Chima was even more ambitious, because they developed a simple tool. Healthy Conflict. Oh, this is so interesting. Well, give me a second to read this. Healthy Conflict. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, interesting. So placement, no product portfolio should have entries on the same placement. I feel like nowadays Lego Monkeykin and Ninjago are very much placed in the same graphic, but I don't know. I guess this was back then. Uh, Lego Friends is high reality, low conflict. Yep, high reality, high conflict is police for city. High fantasy, low conflict is Disney Princess. 
Ninjago is low reality and medium conflict. So it's somewhat familiar. Okay, makes sense. It's kind of somewhat a realistic world. And medium conflict because there's conflict with the ninja have like our characters that have interests other than fighting. Chima was high fantasy and high conflict. You would think that would be the success for a big theme because that's a really, really cool thing to do. So moving into Chima and the most extreme version of it was to create a whole new color. Whoa, 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 what's this? The designers in the Lego Chima theme considered making a tribe called Prehistorics, which would have included minifigures supporting dino heads. Oh, I wish we got that. That's so cool. It's so cool. Look at that Triceratops. Oh, I wish we got that. Okay. New element colors are more complicated than official elements, or than, than original elements. Yeah, I believe that because it's so complicated to make new things. They contemplated making dinosaurs, but they decided the setting was fanciful enough and only living animals should be included, I guess, until they went to the ice things and did the zombie ones. But lions and crocodiles selected as the initial warring tribes. Special helmets and forms the heads were molded. We have gone very in-depth into Chima concept prototypes. I think I've done four videos on concept art for Chima because they've released, like, all the concept art for it. So, pretty much all... Well, well, not this one. This has not been released yet. This is my first time seeing this. Holy moly. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. Yeah, this is, like, one of my first times seeing this. This is so cool. This is a... I guess a more mythological type approach to Chima. Oh, look at that. Look at that. I wish we got this. Oh, concept art is always cooler than the final thing. Oh my goodness, just look at how cool this is. Oh, mechanical goat legs. Wow. But ultimately, Chima secured permission to introduce olive green and use it extensively alongside traditional and dark green. Muted marshy tones stood in stark contrast to the bright yellows and dark reds to the opposing lion tribe. Yeah. So they made a, a permission to introduce a new color, and there was a more technical challenge for printing, so they spent most of its frame allotment on casting a number of existing elements in olive green, so the remaining budget was unique animal helmets. Uh, graphic designers wanted to do molded heads, but instead did helmets so they could be swapped around. Ability was that they could play storylines where someone from one tribe disguised themselves as another while still retaining their identity. Huh, interesting. That never really happened in the show. It wasn't like, they weren't really helmets, they were faces, but I guess that was the initial design. So, they had to do a specialized pad printing type thing. So, challenge your graphic designers who have to take into account how much the pad will have to be deformed. Yeah, that was a challenge, and that's why minifigure decoration became even more detailed after Chima. But the only thing missing was the X factor. This is interesting. New elements have services that require the manufacture of a new machine part to hold the element in firmly. So spinners, there was a throwaway graphic for a small lion motorcycle. Boys liked the one shown, especially the motorbike, so they wanted to come up with the speedors. They made all sorts of ramps and prototypes, and a small selection were made with more held in reserve, assuming they took off in the event that children found them less intuitive than Spinning Ninja and Heart of the Master. They end up being the start of the, just the start of the challenges faced by Chima at the hands of Ninjago. There's that concept art. We've seen this before. I, I did a we've seen the full high-res version of this image before, but that is cool. Chima was set to replace Ninjago. They'd stopped making new Ninjago products. But eventually, after a lot of outcry, as we know, they had to make them continue at the same time. Oh, that's interesting. Huh. Yeah, they were using that like Lego racer style of ramp. That is very interesting. To win, go the furthest over the ramp. Yeah. Wow. Can a minifigure fly? With the Ninjago being relaunched, they needed a new X Factor. They had another dream, making the minifig fly. Multiple attempts had been made to get minifigures airborne since the 1980s. Town had attempted with helicopters, and recently Exoforce had experimented with flyers as well. I did not know that. Huh. They did a lot of test flights, and they didn't work. Models were not stable enough to fly properly. I did not know they tried to do that with Exoforce. Oh, well, here's another thing. Follow-up themes like Ninja vs. Snakes. Yeah, this is the Serpentine. This image shows different design complexities based on how many new element frames that would be allowed. Wow. Look, whoa, I've never seen these before. So they had five different categories. Either you have the classic Lego base and graphics, so no new elements. You have the same molded headgear for all snakes, so for lower ranks. Or you could personalize the headgear with different accessories. 
new molded elements for each tribe was an option, and then the leaders are just completely unique things on their own. So, Fangpire, oh wow, the color schemes are all, all messed up here. This was early designs. So, Fangpire, they're like vampires, bite, jump attacks, body can flatten and glide through the air. I guess we have that initial image of the Fangpire going through. Maybe they were undead snakes. Okay, interesting. Huh. I like those blades. I kind of wish we got those blades as a concept. Constrictars, which eventually became the Constricti. I, Constrictars and Vipoids. That na those names went so far uh, for the Constricti and the Venomari that they can be seen in some early Ninjago episode descriptions. They call them the Constrictars and the Vipoids before they change it last minute. So they crush, they burrow through ground and surprise prey. Oh, I like this one. I wish we got one that would look like this. That's a really cool one. Yeah. This looks like Chima concept art. I think this is the same artist who did the Chima concept art, because it looks very close. Vipoids, they could spit acid that eats armors, causes hallucinations, chameleon-like. That's cool. Look at that. Oh, wow. And then the Hypnobri. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is more of an Aztec-like design with the fins. Rattler tails control the mines. Yeah. Wow, that's a really interesting design for that. There's that Prince of Persia blade. Huh. Cool. Yeah, this is cool. I wish we got a snake arm for, for the minifigures. That would have been a cool thing to get. Anyways, that was showing different design complexities based on how many new element frames allowed. And then we go to Air Jitsu. So talking about the different flyers, we've seen a lot of Air Jitsu prototypes, but they're trying to come up with different types of things. A modified version of the Speed Horse Rip Cores from Chima. And the flyers are front and center in the relaunch 2014... Well, I guess 2015 was when they really launched for Air Jitsu in 2015. Yeah, I think they... So they were trying to do it, they wanted to get it done in time for 2014, but they didn't, is what I'm guessing. That's why it was 2015, but that makes sense, yeah. Chima had followed the path Ninjago had been expected to take, retiring after a healthy run. It was not a smash success, which would have been deemed a smash success if Ninjago had not shattered expectations. So Ninjago was so, so good, and Chima was probably going to be considered a huge hit until it was like, well, Ninjago did so much better, so... There are now a specific the name for product lines based on icons like Ninjago power themes. Okay, if Ninjago was still going to be around, they needed to create a theme that was not going to steal any glory from the mighty ninja. It needed to be worlds apart than what had come before. Speedors had been too similar to Ninjago's spinners. Children who liked competing with spinners were likely to be the same ones who would compete jousting with spinner speedors, so they wanted to do something completely different. It wasn't enough to just do color changes and novelty figure parts. Coexisting with Ninjago meant the theme had to be dramatically different visually. Chima vehicles, if you stripped away the fresh colors and animal details, could have almost fitted into the Ninjago world. Greater differentiation was needed, and the answer was a new category of parts. Structural elements. Huh. Oh, Nexo Knights, that's why they have the wall stuff. Okay. Oh, okay. So they had to make something more unique. Okay. The approach was reflected in element themes granted to the successor of Chima, 42 new element frames allotted to Nexo Knights. So pirates, cowboys, and more had gone into the funnel, but there was too much overlap. A clear winner emerged, knights. Medieval warriors were absent from pop culture at the time, and children wanted knights. The question was in what form? They developed concept for police knights. <laughs> police knights. Someone in the Discord made a comment about this. Space police negative three instead of space police three. <laughs> oh man. Imagine if we got Night Police instead of Nexo Knights. Fire Knights, Classic Knights, Warhammer 40k style Knights. You can still see a little bit of inspiration on that, and like Axel and stuff like that. And a throwback to the first iteration of Ninjago, Tech Knights. So of course that's what we got. We have seen this image, I believe, before on the Visual Dictionary, or the, not the, on the uh, character encyclopedia for Nexo Knights. First time we have the digital image of it though, so... Oh, I wish we got this. So cool. I love the Tron Daft Punk inspired ones. Honestly, all these are really cool. Yeah, I really like a lot of these. Yeah, cool designs. Okay, so Nexo Knights came in the picture. Early prototypes for a more Warhammer style approach to what would eventually become Nexo Knights. Oh, that is cool. I don't think we've seen clear images of these prototypes before. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. Huh, okay. Uh, designers on the team favored an industrial Warhammer 40k styled approach. Ninja were light-footed and relied on stealth, whereas Warhammer was the complete opposite. It relied on big, heavy machines that didn't need to hide because they could take the hits, to differentiate itself from Ninjago. 
Unfortunately, they tested poorly with children, who liked the bulkiness, but consistently preferred Tech Knights, rather than the Warhammer 40k bulky ones. They were responding well to an element that kept showing up in concept boards, a book of monsters. So eventually, the books, they opened the book page, and the monsters emerged from battle, so that was the concept for Nexo Knights. But what if the knights countered this magic, not through alternate spells, but downloading powers from the cloud? That would bring in the tech aspect with children loved. So they had the shield aspects, they had the, a lot of development for the shields, depicting them was an interesting challenge. Initially, they prototyped shields with mesh covers. Inserts depicting powers could be slid behind the mesh, but it was tricky to manufacture and lack connectors. But making separate parts for the shields and powers felt like a sound idea. So there are synergies that led to breakthrough moments, shields and powers could be linked through digital and physical play. A smartphone game could be developed that would allow scanning technology to recognize the images printed on LEGO shields. Scanning, right, could allow them to scan it in, but it was an incredible burden on shield designers because the single element had to facilitate scanning, be fun to play with, compatible with other LEGO bricks, and have a distinctive look because it would be the centerpiece. First priority is to establish what would it look like. So there's that early uh, slide through mesh cover. Ooh, I'm glad they didn't come up with that. In the midst of this, oh, that's interesting. One of the team members picked up a prototype 3x2 studless plate, which was being circulated for review as the latest expansion of the tile family of elements. In a moment of inspiration, he clipped off the last third from both long sides to create a pointed end, and this became the Nexo shield piece. It's cool they have, like, latest, like, expansion of elements just being developed and, like, round tables for that. That's really cool. I like that. Yeah, this is interesting stuff. So structural elements have to be created, so final set designs to be developed. Sync of point and power tile led with facets being developed. Right, so they had the first foray into structural elements, which were making more angled elements. That's very cool. So they wanted to have the Nexo piece being unlocked earlier than intended due to high demand, so other teams were allowed to use it on the condition they wouldn't print anything on it for the first year. So that makes sense. It's I think it's good they, they allowed other teams to use it, because that was a really, really versatile piece. They had a lot of new minifig accessories, as well as a family of faceted elements that were developed for it. Yeah. Nexo Knights ran for two years, while Ninjago remained a hugely popular theme. So Nexo Knights was, eh, didn't sell too well. One Big Bang theme, however, exceeded even the impact that Ninjago had, and catapulted the Lego brick from beloved toy to cultural icon. That's the Lego movie. Oh yeah. Okay, so it was... Developed like a standard in-house theme, but they worked with animators to develop designs that would work on screen and off. Oh, this is cool. I don't think we've seen this before. So we know that previously the villain for the Lego movie was supposed to be Black Falcon, and it was a reference to the original Black Falcon Knights from Castle. I I, I don't remember who had told us that before. I Maybe it was one of the movie directors that said originally the movie villain was named Black Falcon. And Crazy King Carl was originally the guy behind Cloud Cuckoo Land, and he was actually kind of a villainous character in the end, so that was an original idea for him. Of course, you have Benny D Duplo guy. I guess that was going to be one of the... <laughs> Metal Beard was just supposed to be Neckbeard. <laughs> oh my goodness, that is hilarious. Simply Neckbeard. <laughs> that is just... <laughs> That's actually really funny. Okay. Yeah, we've got a real neckbeard moment right there. Of course, you have Batman. You have the robots being used. So you have a, the robots for the Lego movie, which did become the villain. So you have the ninja robot, robot guard, bad cop. Oh, bad cop was going to be a robot. I am not a robot. A Viking ro- Oh, that is sick. That's really cool. I wish we got this. This would be a cool collectible minifigure, I think. And of course, Black Falcon, who is going to be the main villain. Doris Emmett's mom. Huh, interesting. Gemini or Lucy. So I guess that was changed to Wild Style. There's Emmett, Larry the Barista. I guess he was supposed to be a more inter like important character. And Vitruvius, of course. Yeah. To set him apart, maybe give him a different color helmet from other construction workers. Yeah, okay. So upon release, the Lego movie was a massive blockbuster which spawned a cinematic universe. So that was pretty crazy. And that was the ultimate X factor that brought Lego bricks to become a cultural zeitgeist. Big Bang themes continued after Nexo Knights. First came... Hidden Side was a Big Bang theme? Oh, rip. That's unfortunate. I thought it was just a, a one-off theme. Oh, wow. Okay. Followed in 2020 by Lego Monkey Kid. Obviously, that's a big, big one for Strong Worlds. Monkey Kid... Yeah, so those, those are two big ones. And that was how that happened. Okay. We're on page 488. How many pages do we have left? Oh. Okay, we're almost through. Chapter 11. Everything is awesome. Thanks to wide exposure, the LEGO brick became a cultural phenomenon. So now they can make larger and more daring products than ever before. 
Why is the set selling so well? Set 486, building banana. What is that? What? Selling so well. Huh. Was this like the start of what they were doing for modular buildings? So this, this is like a really popular... I didn't know this was like so popular. That's so interesting. Huh. Why is the set selling so well? 486 was nobody's idea of a blockbuster, but numbers didn't lie. Sales were exceeding all expectations by a large, wide margin. What a good problem to have. It prompted a special investigation. A strangely named set hailed a special thing. Okay, so that was Creator 3-in-1. Okay, so this is talking about Creator 3-in-1, basic freestyle. Okay, so we're talking about LEGO Creator. So they oftentimes don't get frames because designers are celebrating what's available, right? So they don't they try not to make new pieces for it. Creator did Mechs before Exoforce. Brick Belt Dragons before Ninjago. That's right, yeah. Creator became the home for pirates, castles, and other themes when the wider portfolio would no longer accommodate them. Yep. Yeah. So, the most advanced building was a two-story house. Windows small on the fence. Empty shell. Nothing inside. Management was confused when it flew off shelves. What was going on? So, they were trying to wonder why was it so popular. Children were not buying it. Adults were. Not just one copy, but multiple ones. By this time, they had the ambassador program in place really as far back as then. I didn't know it was that early. They asked a simple question, why are you buying so many of this one set? Because the LEGO group neglected sets based on everyday life. Houses were a staple, and they loved having these classic houses in their displays. Building Bonanza was the first to come along in years, and fans were snapping it up in the belief it may be their first and only chance in a long while. They were surprised, but maybe the adult market could support larger buildings. Oh yeah. So that became the modular buildings, I bet. At the time, a major focus of the adult community were doing the moon-based project and focus on modularity. They wanted to do a neighborhood for an urban setting to meet the desire for houses, but also be able to do it as a city street. They wanted them to not resemble doll's houses, but really have something that had full interiors and big structures. Yeah, so this was a big, big thing. Big thing for them. Windows and Doors initially proposed three models. Oh, I didn't know this. So they had a San Francisco-style grocer, so I guess the green grocer, a New York fire station. I mean, I guess we eventually got a big fire station for modulars, and a French cafe. We got the Parisian cafe later on for modulars. So we got all of them. Oh, well, the French cafe was the hotel. Oh, Cafe Corner. Okay, okay, that makes sense. We did get the other two later on, so that does make sense. Uh, work began very quickly. They started to make specialized new doors. Okay. Several years later, they were able to make new doors because they didn't want to have the large blemish, <laughs> the bullet hole. Yeah. Okay, so they're talking about the injection molding, how to do that. Jumper plates, a new family of pieces. Let's see, any other interesting things to see here? Yeah, lots of gaping openings. The older style door was the only kind available for Cafe Corner. Every future modular building would use newer variants developed in the years after it. And a whole family of windows were used during that development. Right, and now all those windows are used all the time. So Cafe Corner had an advantage, even though it had so many limitations, because it was so surprising, because it was so unique. They were using skis from Ice Planet to make the, the design for that. Yeah, that's, that's right. Belleville had been retired, which meant its catalog of unique parts, which had previously been locked for use anywhere else, became available. Huh, interesting. That's how they were able to use the lamppost, so they held off and destroying the mold until after Cafe Corner was retired and eventually become a staple of the line. So, yeah, ended up having to get renewed, so they had to keep that Belleville lamppost around all the time now. Yeah. Wow, this is so interesting. So then from there, they had Cafe Corner's alternate models, so they made two additional options, because it started off as a creator three-in-one set. But then they realized it was an inordinate amount of time, huge resource strain, few if any consumers were going to take apart and rebuild a massive set. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, interesting. The back of the box showed an alternate model as well as, right, as well as if you got multiple of them, you could make a, a big, big one. <laughs> Times six, you could make a massive one. <laughs> oh, yeah. High volumes of customers were ordering six copies of the set, exactly the number needed to create the biggest combination of it. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy stuff. So then they decided to make a whole set of stuff for modular buildings. Very, very cool stuff. Cheese slopes. Oh, wow. Right. They made cheese slopes for these. Right? Or no, they, they started to popularize cheese slopes for them. Yeah. Okay. 
UCS Millennium Falcon were to do a proper minifigure scale version for adult stuff. Ritual making pilgrimage, just the new element wall. Yeah, okay. Okay. A bigger wheel. Ferris wheel, right. So I wanted to do a big Ferris wheel. Uh, the merry-go-round, oh, love that set. Grand Carousel is so good. And it had the big, big base plate as well. Yeah. So eventually they had to make more sturdy base plates because that one was, whoa, whoa. Wait. Wait. Let me read through this. Upon its release in 2009, the Grand Carousel was a masterpiece, but the big green base plate was... Uh, because the, uh, they're single section, right? They're they're flexible, so it's very hard for consumers to move it around. The set was prematurely canceled as a result. Oh, that's why the Grand Carousel is so rare. They had to take it off shelves because it was so hard to move around. Huh. That makes sense. I didn't know that they purposefully had to prematurely cancel it. Really, it did really well, but they had to exit it early because it was too hard to move around. That makes sense. Okay, so then can you make holiday themes? That became the Winter Village stuff. Makes sense for that. They also raided Belleville for some unique items there. A larger Lego Belleville star, of course. Used as a fireplace front. Was used as a decorative arch for Belleville. Right, that main front part right there. Winter Village Choice Stop was a hit, and they started making more Winter Village sets. Yeah, Okay. And then we're talking about bigger things. Uh, Taj Mahal was a passion project. I mean, well, this was originally released in like 2006 or 7, right? Or 2008. And they re-released it in 2017. Maybe the, the author didn't realize that. Um, yeah, but no, very cool stuff to see that. New Dreams, right, Kuso for Lego Ideas. So that was to which get fan projects. I think all of this is pretty much known. I am skimming this if there's anything specifically unique for this so it's now ideas get new molds which is right hmm okay yeah then we're we're into the future with lego adult oriented sets and we've finally made it to the epilogue this is a really really cool book to read and obviously there have been so many interesting things that just this book has been an absolutely insane resource that's just so, so cool to be able to just take a look at and be able to enjoy. <laughs> Each chapter is themed to Lego Cobbler. A lot of love went into making this book, for sure. So, and this is so cool. They list all the sources of the interviews that they conducted. Over 60 interviews over a six-month period. Remarkable access to its personnel. So cool. I have Tommy Anderson, Christian Faber... Um, Niels, Niels Milan peterson yeah, oh wow, good, good stuff here. Acknowledgements, AFOL advisory panel, Andrew Barnick, nice! Oh wow, these are so cool, these are all the people who worked, uh, and Daniel Constant, uh, Daniel Konstansky is the US, US editor for Blocks, right. Index, wow. Well, there you have it. This was The Secret Life of Lego Bricks, crowdfunded by Unbound. Now, as uh, folks who were able to pledge money to support this, really, really interesting stuff. All of these people have this book. Yeah, wow. They list out the names of everyone who bought it. That's so interesting. I did not. I was not lucky enough to get this. I had to get this secondhand. I didn't get this by crowdfunding it. But wow, this was such an interesting read. This has been a very long video. I hope you've enjoyed this journey. It is now past midnight for me, so I got to get to bed and call this a day. But... I hope you enjoyed the many different, very interesting insights from this book. It's been so fascinating being able to get a chance to see the history of the LEGO group. I learned so many things that I would have never known before. I think there's so much unique information in this book that has literally never been revealed ever before. So, yeah, this was just such a unique and interesting read. Let me know in the comments, what was your favorite piece of information here? And I know I'm going to mention the conclusion. I'm going to look into ways of making it available digitally. Thankfully, in the time between recording that conclusion and publishing this video, someone sent me the PDF. So the PDF is now available for you to download yourself down in the description below. So if you want to just read the book yourself, I've linked the PDF on Google Drive. So you do not have to spend $250 like me to purchase the book. 
I hope you've enjoyed this look at it. I really, my goal for this was to make this very, very interesting information publicly accessible to those who want to see it and those are, who are interested in the history of the LEGO group. And hopefully this video has achieved that. So thank you so much for coming along this journey with me. And I hope you enjoyed this look at the secret life of LEGO Bricks. All right, and with that, we have summed up a pretty long and momentous look at this massive book, Secret Life of Lego Bricks. I was shocked to see just how much information was in this book that has never publicly been revealed before and since. Concept art, prototype models, different designs for themes, early options for themes, really, really interesting stuff, really good in-depth look at how the Lego company operates. I definitely want to spend more time going through this book. We have barely scratched the surface of the information included here. I really want to make the contents of this book somehow publicly available for folks who do want to read it, because I think there's a lot of great information and stuff to learn here. Maybe what we'll do in the future is I may just do a full like book reading of this book. It'll be a very long video, but if folks are interested, we may do something like that. Let me know down in the comments below, what do you think is the best way to actually get the contents of this book um, to be shared on this channel? Because it's a really, really interesting read. Lots of amazing concept artwork here stuff about bionicle ninjago chima and of course lego's early history pirates castle space getting into like power miners and early designs of that lots of great stuff in here so i hope you enjoyed this brief look or not that brief look at the secret life of lego bricks book and let me know down in the comments below if you want to see more content from this thank you all so much for tuning into duck bricks be sure to like and subscribe for even more lego news reviews discussion and analyses coming away very soon thanks so much and bye for now